It's my great pleasure and joy to welcome you all to our final Zika Plan dissemination event. Zika Plan stands for Zika Preparedness Latin American Network. My name is Annelise Wildersmith and I am the scientific coordinator of Zika Plan. Zika Plan is funded by the European Commission and brought together 25 leading research and public health organizations over the past five years from Latin America, North America, Africa, Asia, and Europe. To mark the culmination of now almost five years of transnational efforts, we have been hosting a series of open access public webinars featuring some of the key scientific findings of our consortium. Today is the last of such events. This time it will be different. While during the first couple of webinars, we focus on the science, today we will focus on the legacy that Zika Plan will leave behind uh, in the, uh, in, for, for the Zika field, but also beyond Zika. Today is also different as we will have the coordinators from Zika Alliance, Zika Action, and recode it with us. United, we are stronger in tackling Zika and we want to showcase the strength of this collaboration. Before I continue, I would like to first thank the Global Health Network for hosting these webinars. In particular, many thanks to Raman Preet from Umeå University and to Bonnie Baker from the Oxford University and from the Global Health Network for pulling together all the strengths to make these webinars happen. Let me move first to some housekeeping um, a points. So this webinar is being recorded. Participant videos and microphones have been disabled. Uh, if you do want to communicate with us, and we encourage you to communicate us with us, please use the chat box. You can introduce yourself and you can post any comments. Uh, be sure when you do so that you select all panelists and attendees from the list so that we can all see it. To the panelists, I would like to encourage you to also join any you know, discussions, questions, comments, uh, and you have the opportunity to, to just turn on your video, unmute yourself uh, and talk. Um, so uh, please use the Q&A box. So there's a Q&A box on the right hand side uh, to submit your questions throughout the seminars. So the Q&A box is really where we will look through uh, uh, what questions came up and, and the moderator will then pull out those questions. You can also um, you know, give your signals, your, 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 your what's it called, <laughs> your thumbs up if you like the question and then it will be put, um, it will be prioritized. Um, all right, so these were the housekeeping announcements back to the first slide. We will now have a, uh, we will start with a panel panel discussion. So why a panel discussion? Um, and so building sustainable research networks and all the capacities needed to respond to Zika or the emergence of another uh, pathogen uh, is the core of Zika plan. But this was only possible because of the collaboration with other research net networks, in, in particular with other EU funded Zika consortia. And so we really had a tremendous collaboration over the past years with Zika Action and Zika Alliance. Uh, and these Zika consortia were unique in that we designed additional work packages for shared communication platforms, shared newsletters, governance structures, shared ethics approach. So, so, so in total, the three of us uh, really encompass many countries and many trial sites and study sites in the Caribbean and South America. So uh, it's now a pleasure to announce the moderator who is no other than Dr. Arjon von Hengel, who is the team leader of infectious diseases uh, at the DG Research and Innovation of the European Commission. So, so welcome and, uh, to Arjon and I would also like to announce the panelists and I would like to ask all the panelists to now turn on your video so you are visible. So we will have Xavier de Lombalari, who is the Sick Alliance 
coordinator, Carl, Professor Carlo Giacquinto, who's a SIG action coordinator. We have Thomas Jenisch, who, uh, who was part of SIG Alliance, where he led all the clinical cohort studies. And as a result of this, um, uh, achieved to obtain another um, EU funded a consortium called Recoded. So he re represents Recoded today, and he will share you more what it actually is. I'm very pleased to also uh, welcome Professor Carlos Pardo Villamizar, who is originally uh, Colombian, is now based in the US, but really through his connections and his networks, we were able to build up a very strong Eurozika network in Colombia, and he will share more about it. And last but not least, not least is Professor Trudy Lang, who is from Oxford University, who is the overall coordinator of the Global Health Network and who led the work package, um, uh, which, uh, and then a network that she called Ready. And Ready is the Portuguese and Spanish name for network, um, uh, where, where she brings, where she has a cross cutting work package with all the three consortia. So, welcome, Trudy. Uh, I will now hand over to the moderator and happy to help you as well, Arion, wherever you need it. And anyone feel free to post your questions and, and anyone else, you know, feel free to, to chip in. Over to Arion. Thank you, Annelies, for the introduction and your kind words. So I would like to first uh, wish everybody a nice day. It might be a good morning, a good afternoon, a good evening, depending on the place of the world where you are. So. Um, first of all, my excuse is that uh, my director, Irene Nostad, would not be able to, to participate here and to do the moderation. She would have liked to do that, but at the last moment, because we are dealing with the pandemic, and there are so many urgencies that she was in the end prevented to, uh, to do this, so she asked me to replace her. So I'm very happy to do this, of course, because the Zika projects have a special situation and a special place almost in our heart, I would say, because it is work on infectious diseases that is particular dealing with epidemics and pandemics. And it's very clear nowadays, of course, what this situation is, that you need to work together in the case of an epidemic or a pandemic, that you have to initiate your research reaction in time for that to collect the, the data to fill the knowledge gaps. And you can only do that in collaboration. And I think that is really the power here of these projects that we're talking about that are dealing with an epidemic on a worldwide scale. So your projects have started in 2016. And that was really a moment that we started a new initiative in this area so that we were looking for these infectious diseases really outside the borders of Europe and go for a worldwide collaboration. Now, of course, if you are starting that and, and you are kind of trendsetters in this area, you also have to face many obstacles. And, and of course, that is very clear, but it's very important also to find out what the problems are that, that you're running into and try to find as researchers solutions to come up with that. So I think that a very important element was also the fact that these three consortia worked closely together via common work uh, package across the three projects because that really allowed a deeper collaboration between the projects and and this was something quite innovative we did not have that in many projects and i think that it's also setting a certain trend that we've also continued in in other projects that are funded nowadays so working worldwide of course also makes that you have a special situation and in the consortium of research funders around the, the globe, the Globit uh, consortium, that has also been in the spotlight. So the workshops on synergies that they have organized on Zika is, of course, very much helped by, by the work that you've been doing in your three projects. So this collaboration, I said, is very important because it avoids duplication and it makes better and a more efficient use of resources. And it helps us, of course, to, to work together with another part of the, of the world, and especially, of course, in the Latin American research region, where we now set up via your project a research preparedness uh, uh, network. And as I said, this has also influenced what we are doing on the European scale. So in Europe, for instance, we have the PREPARE project that is working on, on emergencies 
and that has already the links with uh, with what's happening in the, your Zika projects. And it also, of course, in EDCTP, where we're working together with Africa, you see that this collaboration between different projects is based on, on the idea that you're also using in the Zika projects. Now, a very important element here, of course, is also the data sharing. And again, that is not something that you can take for granted. I think in, in the emergency and the public health response, this data sharing is very important because researchers can build on existing data, they can use each other's data, and in that way, actually catalyze their own research. So making this data quickly available in emergency situations like a pandemic or an, an, an epidemic is in, very important. And it also allows you, of course, to pull data if possible so that you can generate stronger, more robust results in a faster way. So I'm very happy that the efforts that the Zika projects have put into this have really advanced the field a lot and, and led to cooperation that was not there before. And another aspect, of course, that the Zika projects have played an important role in is the setting up of cohorts. And they are, of course, crucial for research preparedness. And that is also recognized in, in the organizations like, uh, like Globe with R. It is also now very relevant, of course, for the COVID-19 pandemic, where, for instance, on the European uh, level, we have funded the orchestra projects that also has links with in other parts of the world, including the uh, Latin American region. So taking all this together, I think that the, the Zika epidemic has led to a research response through your three projects that have really changed the, the field as such by bringing in a more global approach, a stronger collaboration between different parts of the world by setting up and collecting data in a, in a way that had not been done before in, in also an area where maybe um, big advances could be made. So again, coming back to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, of course, we see that everything that has been initiated under the, the three Zika project has very much been instructing and, and a learning exercise for our activities also to deal with the, globe, with the COVID-19 pandemic. So I would like to thank you already for all the work that you have done and uh, make sure that what we are doing here on the European Commission level is learning from what has been set up within the Zika projects and also use that knowledge for further investment for the, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic and also in the context of the, the, the new ideas, for instance, like, like the Health Emergency and Response Agency that is being set up on the European level to use this experience that has been generated by you and to deal uh, with the current pandemic and, and to maybe further um, put investment into this area. So I would like to thank you again for your invitation. And now actually I would like to go over to ask some questions to the coordinators of the Zika projects. So if you allow me, Annalisa, I would like to start with you. And I would like to ask you if in about five minutes you could tell me what achievement of your project is likely to have the greatest long-term impact. So that is on your project level, but also what is the advantage of the collaborative effort? So with having these three consortia together, is there maybe something that you have now achieved that you could not achieve without this collaboration? Over to you, Annalise. Yes, no, thank you for, for your question. Um, so uh, obviously all three consortia set out to address a number of research questions and address a, num a, a wide range of, of research, of knowledge gaps. But where we really uh, leveraged upon coming together as three consortia was obviously with the access to pregnant women cohort studies. And then obviously also the um, affected children born to mothers who had an infection during pregnancy. And, and so with, with, with that, uh, so we had access to a larger sample size, but also access to a better geographic distribution. So Zika Alliance, for example, has an incredibly good um, uh, distribution, many, many sites. 
Um, uh, others like Sig, Sig Action was very strong in their ethics background, had a full work package on ethics that we could all benefit from. And 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 then we had experts um, like like you know statisticians that we could share. And also under the leadership of Thomas Jenisch, we were able to um, you know try to harmonize the variables uh, and try and and the protocols uh, decide what is the minimum requirement for for the harmonizations. Where do we allow it to be different? We are different, and the strength is sometimes also to be different. Um, and then and then pull the data together. And but I think I think the last the most important impact was you know because we were three consortia with an access to probably the largest cohort studies globally. Um, WHO noted it, and we were invited to become part of their coordinated approach that brought many sites together for even larger meta meta analysis of individual patient um, um, uh, numbers. So, so um, I think the uh, the strength was therefore not duplication, but expansion, expansion, by also then maximizing uh, some of the governance structures, so that you have minimal, you know, you, you, you maximize the output with minimal use of of uh, of, of resources, um, uh, and so so I think. Uh, we, we did, a, you know, we, we established a governance structure together, we had a communication channel, we tried to be what Xavier calls a one voice, so we would, you know, we, we could share and advocate together as three consortia, we became, you know, there was a strong visibility because we were, you know, there's two, there are hundreds of people involved in the three consortia. Zika plan alone, hundred, I think Zika action is, is I don't know, but Zika Alliance definitely far more than hundred. So, so, so we were also a very large group. So, so there's visibility, there's critical mass. And with that, you get listening ears. So, so, you know, the politicians, policymakers, leading academic institutions, especially in Brazil, you know, invited us, wanted to be part of it. And, and so we were also part of Globet R meetings, um, etc. So I think that is all for me and, and happy to share more, but I think the others will have much more to add. Thank you. For, excuse me. Thank you very much, Anaris. So now I would like to give the word to Xavier from the Zika Alliance to answer actually the same question. So what is the achievement of your project that you think is having the greatest long-term impact? And what is really the thing that you could achieve with the three consortia working together, which you could not achieve as one project on its own? Over to you, Xavier. Xavier. Thank you very much. Um... I think that one of the one of the real questions that we have is that um, probably this was one of the first times that it was clearly put on the table that different consortia would collaborate to create um, knowledge on a single issue, which was Zika. Um, it was something very clear from the beginning, even if. The rules were not so clear because um, we, we, we have been inventing the rules in, 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 in a way. Um, but the, the real question at the end of that is, did this bring something original? Was it beneficial? And could it become a kind of strategy for the commission when creating calls to answer um, emergency events. I, I think it is the case. And when, when, when you look at this, I mean, we have been discovering the rules, but also new opportunities while collabor collaborating. Um, it seems to me that the different uh, consortia um, had prepared projects that were tackling the issue from very different angles. And that's extremely positive, in fact. The three consortia had different approaches. They had different backgrounds. So they were not just competing, they were extremely complementary. And that's something which is a good lesson, I think for us as scientists and, and people in charge of projects, but also for the commission. Um, it works, it's very positive, but maybe the condition is that the rules should be 
given extremely early, which I think now uh, is the case for the for the, the the current projects, because save a lot of time if this has been integrated in the way you have designed your your your, your project. Other, otherwise, I can um, only repeat what uh, Hadelis has said that we have created actual and efficient common governance instances. And it has been working uh, uh, quite well. And the other thing, which is, I think, extremely important, is that we were out of Europe, we're in, in the Caribbean, in Latin America. So we had foreign partners. And maybe for the first time, they heard only one voice coming from uh, Europe, all of the partners talking together with a single objective and a single strategy. And this is excellent scientifically, but it is also excellent in terms of credibility, of course, um, for the commission and for, for, for the scientific consortia. So I think all these items um, are extremely uh, positive. But now uh, we are not at the end of, of, of a process. In fact, I think we are at the beginning of, of, of a process because it, it has been working. So the consortia are recognized, the networks that have been implemented are recognized. And I think that it, it's absolutely excellent that Annelies um, put some emphasis on, on what will be the legacy and what will be the future uh, for these networks, for these cohorts, for this organization, for all the relationship that has been created with the partners in the Caribbean in, in, in Latin America. And this has to be invented now. So I think it's not really not the end of the process. It's just the beginning of a second, uh, a second step, and that we have to, and we have to embark our partners and our institutions um, to 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 invent what, what what it should be for the future. Over. Okay. Thank you very much, Xavier. So indeed, you mentioned complementarity, synergies, but not only that. It goes beyond that because I think that what you said is that that your project has strengthened actually each other. So indeed, you, what you could out what you could get out of it with the three of you is much stronger than what you would get out of it with the three individual projects. And I'm very um, happy about your enthusiasm to continue with this, of course, because uh, I think if you set up something nice like this. You, you should be enthusiastic to, to find ways to continue with it. So my next uh, question is exactly the same question as before, but then directed to, to Carlo Giacinto from Zika Action. So uh, Carlo, please, your next five minutes are for you to uh, yeah. explain. So first of all, I would like to thank you, um, Annalise, Javier, and all the people involved in Zika Alliance and Zika Plan, because for their commitment on women and children. You know, I am a pediatrician, and this is a very personal consideration. And so my life has always been focused to care for pediatric patients and, of course, for mother and women. And this, I think, is the first time that the main focus of three big projects, of course, with the blessing and the behalf of the commission, are really being focused on a vulnerable population, women and children. So that, I think, is a very, very special uh, starting point, which makes, again, this uh, uh, experience and our future work together uh, something quite unique because we have been focused on vulnerable population and that is what it is really needed. I would like also to stress, as Anadis and Javier did already, the complementarity of the networks, because we have been um, you know, looking at uh, uh, the Zika infection, the pandemic, from different perspectives, from basic science, uh, from uh, clinical part, from a social science part, so from a, a lot of different perspectives, you know, address and the bringing different countries from different projects. For instance, in, in we brought uh, um, um, in, in the Caribbean, Haiti and Jamaica, and, uh, uh, you know, um, Zika Alliance brought a lot of Latin American countries there has been a lot of arboviral experience that we didn't have in our network so i think we learned a lot and we hope that uh, 
we really have been able to deliver quite a few, uh, quite a few important things. So beyond that, we do have something very concrete. So Annalise mentioned briefly the work that uh, um, the, the, the uh, Thomas Yenish led work package, led working group uh, uh, really was uh, on uh, harmonizing the data, the data collection. And this is going really to be extremely important, not just uh, in the future eventually to be ready to, to see um, possible a new emergency of the Zika epidemic, but really as an infrastructure, as a basis to look at uh, mother to child transmission of uh, uh, other disease and COVID could be really an, uh, an example. So then another important point that uh, I would like to stress is that uh, as a part of the legacy, as uh, especially for those like you know, PENT, as you know, it is a pediatric research network, we were really able to, to set up uh, this vertical transmission study and pediatric registry in sites which were not previously part of our network. So already for some of these sites, we have been starting other work for other projects outside of Zika. And that I think is going to be something extremely important as well as the, the possibility that we think we will, in the, we will have in the future to work all together. And uh, again, and last but not least, I would like also uh, to mention the work that uh, um, we did really facilitate the WHO IPD meta-analysis, which is something which uh, was really, I think, really strengthened by the participation of our consortia. So we were able really to contribute to um, a larger era and uh, international project, which were beyond uh, our initial uh, scope. So uh, again, I, I would really like to, uh, to thank uh, again uh, Zika Alliance and uh, Zika Plants, all their collaborators, and of course the European Commission for uh, uh, this first milestone of uh, our uh, trip and journey together that I hope uh, will last uh, much, much longer. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Carlo. And indeed, so you mentioned already, of course, how some of the work that, that you initiated within the Zika project is feeding over into new projects, especially also the, the project on COVID-19. And I think it's, uh, it's, again, a very important element. So the experience you had also in the data area is very useful, of course, to, to deal with in the current uh, projects that are working on COVID-19. So my next question is uh, to Professor Trudy Lang. I think that you are involved in all three of the projects, so you're really an, an, a glue factor probably between these two, three projects. And what I would like to ask you is, how has the development of RED-E through these three Zika consortia efforts helped to leverage the role of RED-E in response to COVID-19? So how was the sustainability of RED-E actually promoted? Over to you, uh, Trudy. Thank you very much. And um, it's just great to have everybody brought together and, and try and summarize what we've all been doing over the last few years. So um, yeah, well done, everybody, and thank you. Um, well, exactly. I think for us, the um, you know, who we were a year ago, um, and it enabled us to really put in place everything we have established with Ready and bringing all of our partners together and linking it up with other projects and initiatives is the whole point. You know, the, the EU Commission tasked us at the beginning of this grant to work across all three consortia. As you say, I was going to use the phrase, the glue that brings it all together, um, tasked us with being a cross-cutting element um, to try and make the, the sum greater than the parts, as we said, and, and what we have achieved, I'll, I'm going to present later on, um, but it is this huge community of practice. And about um, two years ago, we secured this, the future of, of READY through our partnership with FIA Cruz, um, and also have been working to link ready up with many other sort of emerging um, research networks in the region, but also more widely across um, Africa, say, and Asia, with our other partners within the Global Health Network. And so, as soon immediately, the, the, it, it was clear what was happening with the with the pandemic. We we set up um, 
the um, international um, re um, response from our perspective to COVID by, by setting up the Global Health Research Implementation Hub for, for COVID-19. And, and Ready was the leadership group for that in Latin America. And, and within that hub, you can see where we have Latin America, Asia and Africa. And the intent was to bring exactly the same resources, tools and awareness to researchers in, in those settings as were available anywhere in the world. So everybody had the same equitable chance to conduct research within the, the pandemic and, and learn in their own settings. And the Ready Network just completely was able to step in and with the um, working very strongly with FIA Cruz, um, we were able to get resources out in, in Spanish and Portuguese. We could link up groups in Brazil with groups in, in Mozambique and Angola. And um, I'm going to talk more of the details later. But, you know, we were tasked with ready of having a network that could support research capacity building in Zika and then be ready for another <laughs> outbreak. And so we've just that's just rolled straight into to COVID-19. But it does that because it's putting in place the capacity to work on everyday diseases that affect populations. And I think that's my main point is we hear a lot about talking about preparedness research. And I think that's a, a really um, almost an oxymoron that you, you can't just suddenly be prepared for research and only by having ongoing research capabilities in healthcare facilities that's able every day to, to gather evidence on the diseases that are in front of people every day only then can those skills, abilities and mandate pivot to work on an outbreak. And that's the goal of the Ready Network to, in, to embed research capabilities for the everyday that can respond to an outbreak. And, and that's what we've then harnessed here, working with all the partners and, and, um, and the networks we've established as I'll, as I'll talk to you later. Okay, thank you very much, Trudy. I think indeed this is very important. We see that also on, on the European level that what we are investing in is ready networks to, to deal with the pandemics and to deal with infectious diseases in general. So my next question will be for uh, Thomas Janis, who is the Zika Alliance work package leader, but also as Annelies already mentioned, the recorded coordinator. So, Thomas, I would like to ask you, how do you assess today, also in the context of the COVID pandemic, the possibilities for harmonizing and sharing international cohort data? And, and how does that compare how the situation today is with how the situation was when the Zika project actually started? And do you think that these Zika projects have contributed to, to a real change of, of data sharing possibilities? So I'm very curious on, on what your opinion about this, uh, Thomas. Over to you. Thanks, Arjun. And I, I have to start with a little bit of a background in order to get to your question in the end. So first, I want to say I'm very enthusiastic about what we set up in terms of continuing pregnant women and children cohorts in Zika Alliance, Zika Action, and, uh, and Zika Plan. And uh, the interesting point is, We've been working with some of these cohorts for a long time in bringing in, for example, cohorts from another EC project that I coordinated on Dengue, the items project. And interestingly, we had three EC funded Dengue projects even that have been collaborating, not as closely as the Zika projects, but there's quite a legacy mm -hmm. also that comes from the, the previous um, round of projects on arboviruses. And I also want to mention that within Zika Alliance, we have actually repurposed our children cohorts to, to COVID with the help or with the permission of the commission. We have discussed this last year and we have uh, started within Zika Alliance then to, to carry over and uh, allow our partners to um, work on vertical transmission and on uh, perinatal transmission of COVID. And, and this is something that has now been included in the orchestra cohort that you have mentioned. So we are partners with some of the Latin American sites in orchestra, albeit it's only a small, small component. And clearly we would like to carry on with this in a bigger platform and in, in, in a bigger um, sustainable way of, of cohort research. Um, Zika has disappeared really fast. Still, we don't understand why it has disappeared as fast as it, as it did. So in a way we, we think it might come back, but it, no, nobody knows. Mm -hmm. And at, as we started, there was parallel epidemics of dengue, Zika, and chikungunya. So it's really that landscape of uh, interacting parallel arbovirus epidemics that we were operating in. 
at that point in time. So with regard to recoded N and Zika Alliance, I think that Zika Alliance and the other Zika projects and the, the common work packages on data sharing really paved the way then to um, make the problems obvious and the challenges obvious, but also the potential obvious for data sharing between infectious disease cohorts. And that was picked up in, in the recorded project. And we also are very intricately involved as uh, uh, Carlos and other, others have mentioned in the WHO IPDMA. So the team in Heidelberg that I um, work with is actually also the team that uh, is uh, coordinating the WHO IPDMA on Zika. I'm one of the co-chairs of the WHO IPD on Zika. Lauren, Lauren Maxwell of the team that is included in, in Recoded. She's uh, leading the, the IPDMA Zika cohort studies or mm -hmm. as a moderator. And I think that we can be proud of this because it's really in the sense of no duplication feeding our strength into this bigger WHO moderated consortium on um, Zika cohorts. Still, we all have our own cohorts and within the three EC funded Zika consortia, there was a lot of sharing and harmonizing. We um, have shared um, or harmonized data dictionaries, a harmonized data analysis plan. Um, we have common lessons that we learned. We are, have put that data together uh, on various levels and we are gonna analyze data together on various levels as well. And, and this has really become easier. I think the technological challenges and the IP intellectual property related challenges with regard to data sharing have really decreased and, and scientists are more ready to share data and it's kind of a no brainer. Of course, we are gonna share data. At the same time, however, the GDPR, the European Data Protection Regulation was uh, started or kicked in. So it was actually starting in 2016, but for many institutions, it was a slightly longer transition turnover so that by 2018, 2019, really everybody got the message. And what we are faced in in Recoded right now is more the legal challenges than the challenges of the scientists not wanting to share data. So we are, we are struggling a lot with that part and uh, we are ready from a technological point of view and from a IP or a scientific point of view to share data. And uh, that's just what it is right now. That's where the field is. And, and we have, I think a very good partnership also between the, the other EU Canada funded projects that Recoded is a part of. There was five or six sister projects funded and they work a lot on, on technological challenges like virtual federated bio, um, data analysis software and how data can be analyzed, not leaving physically, not leaving the original place where it was generated. But those are all solutions trying to um, counteract the challenges that we have because of the GDPR and the data privacy. And we all understand why it's necessary because big companies like Google or Facebook want to uh, sell our data in a way that's a very, very short um, sketch of it. But we are faced with these challenges in this scientific arena now as well. And I think what I would like also in Recoded and what we plan is that we have kind of a bigger uh, platform with the um, regulators or with the commission, with the funders, with the projects, with the scientists who are who are faced with these challenges to look for, for common solutions because some of these challenges are beyond what a single scientific project can deliver. But still the good news is the, the, the overall notion, data sharing, that data harmonization is important and scientists agree about that. And it is very, evident because in Zika, we are faced with that challenge that we individually don't have enough cases or enough numbers to, to tackle certain questions by ourselves. And this is why we need to put our data together in order to reply or respond to certain scientific questions that need larger numbers. Um, I think the last point very briefly I wanna to touch on is preparedness. Um, I think, 
And I agree with Trudy, you can't be prepared without having capacity building for these local um, research centers. And there needs to be continuous ongoing research in order to have that capacity being perpetuated. And these cohorts that we have started, they lend itself to being capacity building sites, but also dissemination sites for good quality research surveillance. And last but not least, diagnostics. We have seen that in preparedness, the, the challenges of diagnostics have been coming back to us all over and every time again. And we need a good strategy how to come up with preparedness in diagnostics. And I think Xavier can, can talk about this more, even more if, <laughs> if there is time for that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Thomas. I think that that was very important, the things you've been saying. And of course, currently in the COVID-19 pandemic, we also run into these issues of, of data and we're very much supporting data sharing, open data, also via the COVID-19 uh, data platform that's been set up for this. But indeed, of course, there are still quite a number of challenges to deal with. But I think here you have, uh, you have made a very good start with the Zika projects. So um, I think we, we learn from the experience that you've built up with your projects and also that you take forward now in the recorded uh, project. So now I would like to open the floor a bit more for the questions. Um, I will take them one by one as they're coming in. So the first question is actually about the three consortia and the working together. So I think this question aims at, is it better now to create one united consortium or is, is really the power still in individual consortia working together? So of course, now you have the experience with the three different uh, projects that are working together. Would that be your optimal way of continuation or would you say, well, it's better to have actually one very large uh, consortium? Annelies, do you want to take this question? If it's for a specific question, for example, really narrowing it down to the pregnant women core studies and following up the children born with congenital Zika syndrome, I think one consortium uh, would be better uh, for, the, for, the, for the future's purpose. If for looking backward, th though, it was better to have the three consortium working independently, but having cross-cutting work packages and having an, and some shared and harmonized work packages, but still with, with a lot of questions that were complementary. Uh, to this to this end, you know, um, you know, we everyone seems to focus only on congenital Zika syndrome, but we have a lot of neurological complications in adults. And uh, with Carlos Pardo being being here, I think, and who led the NeuroZika, which, for example, in our program took three times more money. Than the, than, than, the, than the pregnant woman course studies. Uh, and, and, and we were the only ones doing the neuros, or we were mainly the only ones who did the, the, the adult complications, the neurological complications. So, so maybe I want to give, if you don't mind, Arion, um, whether, whether Carlos could just highlight some of his, uh, of his insights from a neuro Zika adult. Uh, male, I mean, or non-pregnant non <laughs> uh, focus, um, Carlos. Absolutely. Uh, thank you, Annelies. Uh, uh, it's, it's a very important question. And, and, and let me introduce myself. I am a clinical neurologist uh, originally from Colombia. And in Co Colombia, as many Latin American countries have been impacted for many decades by arbovirus infections. Uh, we have experienced outbreaks of uh, dengue. We have experienced outbreaks of chikungunya. And in 2015 and 16, obviously we got the impact of uh, Zika that came with a different flavor as compared with the other arboviruses. And it was the magnitude of neurological complications associated with the sick infection. So with that as a focus, actually uh, in Colombia, we have the opportunity to uh, establish and integrate a network that was focused in neurological problems. And this is basically was the origin of the NEAS network that stands for Neurovirus Emerging in the American Study, in which our main focus was to investigate what is the role that infections uh, like arboviral infections like Zika may play in uh, uh, 
the uh, presence of neuroinflammatory disorders like Guillain Barre, that is a very devastating uh, 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 paralytical disorder that basically produce a lot of uh, uh, neurological uh, uh, disability and long-term consequence, similar to many of the uh, effects of Zika in the pediatric population. But in the adult population, both Guillain-Barre and encephalitis and myelitis have the same capability for producing long-term effects. So by establishing our network in Colombia that integrate basically uh, different centers around the country, uh, uh, that uh, network allow us to uh, establish a, a very good connectivity with different disciplines uh, uh, of uh, clinical research and uh, basic science research. We have the capability to integrate the epidemiologists with the clinician and virologists and laboratory workers. And this is actually one of the major uh, 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 effects uh, that the Zika plan produced in our uh, research uh, focus was our ability to create and integrate this uh, network of uh, researchers. But the, the most important part as well was the ability that we had to integrate with the international networks. And for example, uh, uh, in the case of Guillain Barre, we have the opportunity to uh, interact and integrate to the efforts of the IGOS, that is the International Guillain Barre Outcome Study, that is lead, uh, it's led by uh, Dr. Bart Jacobs uh, in the uh, Netherlands. We have the capability to integrate with uh, Dr. Tom Solomon, Professor Solomon in Liverpool, and Professor Hugh Willingston in, in Glasgow, and many other colleagues in Latin America like Lucia Brito. So the integration with the international groups that are focused on neurological disorder was a very good advantage for uh, our research uh, consortium in Colombia. And that basically uh, facilitated us to produce data and, and, and sustain the research uh, activities of the network because uh, we learn a lot uh, from the observational studies initially, but we later embark in uh, case control studies for understanding what is the real role of arboviral infection like Zika in presence of uh, uh, acute neuroinflammatory disorder. So that actually is a very important product, is the uh, ability that we have to generate more research uh, uh, organized research like case control studies, and also from there to go to more detailed analysis like genomic analysis of the viruses that are circulating in, uh, uh, in the Colombian uh, environment and how those viruses may affect the uh, health of uh, the population. But the most important part as an outcome of this network is that allow us to be prepared for the next outbreak. And that happened in 2020 with the outbreak of, uh, uh, of COVID-19. And our network actually uh, through very important uh, leaders like uh, Lida Osoria, who is an epidemiologist at the Universidad del Valle, and Beatriz Parra, who is a virologist at the Universidad del Valle, allow us actually to be more than ready when COVID-19 uh, hit uh, Colombia. And they play a very important role, not only for developing the strategies, strategies for epidemiological research, but also for laboratory research and diagnosis. And that actually helped us to generate data. And uh, that allow us to generate data that uh, uh, was uh, the basis of support by the National Institute of Health in the United States to continue the network and continue the research effort around the topic of uh, neurovirus emergent uh, arboviruses and the role of those in uh, producing neurological disease. So uh, we went from observational studies to case control studies and we went to generate hypothesis based um, uh, research that allow us actually to propose to NIH to uh, uh, give us support and, and, and obtain support from them to maintain the network uh, for a period of time. And that actually is critical and the support of the Zika plan has been uh, uh, actually uh, very valuable for all of the effort that we have been doing in Colombia and our interactions with colleagues in Brazil, colleagues in Peru and other Latin American countries that are confronting similar uh, challenges of arboviral infections and more recently problems like uh, COVID-19.
Thank you very much, uh, Carlo. I think that is very important to see how the project has, has leveraged actually additional funding and how you continue activities. I think that is uh, it's great to, to hear from you. So um, I will go on to the next question that has come in in the chat, uh, which is from Tom Solomon. Are there lessons for the funders in terms of how to fund three consortia in a competition, but avoiding overlap between projects? What are the reflections of the three consortia leads on this? So does any of you consortium leads want to comment on that or? I can say a few words, maybe. Yes, please. Um, I think I think that the issue is maybe a little bit more complicated than um, proposed by Tom. Because um, Annalise said very well that if you have a very identif clearly identified objective, limited, one consortium is probably more efficient than different consortia. Mm -hmm. But when you face a pandemic, having a single consortium makes no sense. You must tackle the issue from very different angles. That's, that's clear. So that's the first part. The second one is we have discussed all together the issue of competing or not competing on some aspects. And I think that globally, it's absolutely important that different consortia collaborate and they produce um, what is expected from them in terms of knowledge and information. And in my opinion, it's not simplistic to, to say that, and we can admit, and we have admitted and accepted some partial competition on some specific aspects, because we thought that we were not certain that one consortium would, would, would bring um, the, the, the complete answer. And that was rather positive in, in so that's manageable. So um, clearly um, creating consortia that compete on everything, um, and, 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 and lose their time and duplicate all of the efforts is ridiculous. But admitting that some tricky parts of the problem can be studied by different consortia if they share the data and if they try to go ahead with the, the data that they collect is not something ridiculous when you face a new situation where, where you don't know what you're, you're talking about and, and, and you are no precise idea where you where you are going. So I would I would answer to to, to Tom. Um, it's probably some a, a subtle balance between organizing the consortia in such a way that they don't com compete stupidly, but let them compete sometimes on specific issues if this is correctly managed at the level of the direction of the, the different consortia. Over. Thank you very much, Xavier. So maybe I can give some commands from my side, also from the funder side, because of course what we are doing is when we're issuing a research call, we want the best research projects to come on top. And that is an open competition. So, but in the end, of course, you do not want to, want to end up with a set of research projects that are working in isolation and that are competing with each other or that are having overlapping activities because if two research projects are doing the same, it's actually a waste of, of taxpayers' money invested in that without a very good coordination and division of tasks. So I think, again, here, the, the SICA project have set a, the good example with three different research projects, but very well connected with each other through this uh, common work package. So I think this is something that, uh, that we really like to see in this area. So the next question comes from uh, Sony Bashkar. What could funding agencies do to facilitate and reward open sharing of data funded by public agencies? So I think, Thomas, I would give the words to you to answer this one. So a few things. I think one important component is funding agencies should agree on a clause of 
broad informed consent to be included in future studies. And that should perhaps be mandatory if it's okay with local or national legislations. We are struggling a lot now with studies that didn't include broad informed consent initially and uh, then to go back and maybe have to reconsent all participants or have to work with a number of IRB, uh, so ethical review committees in different countries is a lot of additional work. So I think a, a harmonized language of broad informed consent that is almost mandatory for the future would be very helpful. And uh, then the question was really rewarding. So you know how this, the benefits or incentives in science are, are being distributed. It's, a, it's about impact points, it's about publishing, it's about having uh, the institution named. So we, there have been ideas of uh, rewarding scientists for sharing in open repositories and that maybe needs to be something that is relevant for career advancement for scientists and needs to, needs to also come with some kind of reward points. I think we don't have a clear system right now, but there would be this would be an area of work for the future to come up with incentive structures that reward scientists so that they can also advance their careers because in the end, scientists are under the pressure to publish and then they can, they can advance their careers. If they can advance their careers by publishing open data, this would be great as well. And uh, it's the same with reviewing papers. Currently, there's not much reward for reviewing papers, but that is also kind of changing in, 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 a, in a good way. Um, so yes, in uh, informed consent, broad informed consent is a big thing. I think we need to tackle some of the um, side effects of the GDPR, like I mentioned before, mm -hmm. but we also need a, a, a incentive structure for scientists so that sharing behavior is rewarded. Over. Thank you very much, Thomas. I think it's very important elements that you brought forward indeed. So it's the, the rewarding is very important, of course, for people that are doing the job, the scientists, and indeed the, the informed consent uh, is, is very important. So that it's indeed covering what we want to do with the, with the data and with the material. So with this, I think we're nicely on time with this session. So I would first of all, would like to thank all the panelists in this panel for their very valuable contributions and for the, the information that they shared with us. And with this, I would like to return the word to Annelies. Thank you very much. Th thank you, Ion, for, for moderating this, this session, this panel discussion. Um, and we also want to thank you for, no, not, not you personally, but the European Commission, of course, for, for funding us here. And but also, um, you know, making sure that the work package were aligned so that we, and, and we created additional work packages to have an aligned governance, um, et cetera, and, and, and force us to do so. Uh, so the, to, to me, I always say, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, you know, you go, you go with many people. So, and that's and that's what we did. It did, it did slow us down in the beginning. We have to openly admit this. It, it did slow us down. And there were additional meetings and and uh, costs to meet with the others. Um, but in the in the long run, you have a, you have an expanded output. So, so thanking you on the, on this regard. When a cluster of children born with abnormally small head circumferences was detected in northeast Brazil in late 2015, identifying the cause of this rapid and unprecedented surge in microcephaly cases was the immediate need that the medical and scientific community was called to meet. Under the leadership of Brazilian infectious disease experts, a task force, the Microcephaly Epidemic Research Group, was formed bringing together expertise in epidemiology, virology, immunology and social medicine, and cultivating partnerships with other eminent clinic epidemiological investigators across Brazil and worldwide. 
the group laid the groundwork for what was to become the Zika Preparedness Latin American Network, Zika Plan, a multinational project that would not only facilitate research to investigate Zika virus, but also create a long-term platform through which the global scientific community would be available to respond rapidly to any future emerging threats in Latin America. Hosted by Sweden's Ume University and led by scientific coordinator, Professor Annelies Wilder-Smith, alongside project coordinator, Dr. Raman Preet. They were expertly placed to respond to a call from the European Commission as it released funds to investigate the outbreak after the World Health Organization declared Zika a public health emergency of international concern in 2016. Zika Plan harmonized study protocols and initiated a series of groundbreaking epidemiological studies that advanced scientific thought by connecting the microcephaly cases to Zika virus infections in pregnancy and ruling out alternative hypotheses, such as larvicide. This also led to the first clinical description of a new disease, congenital Zika syndrome. What had previously been thought of as a benign mosquito-borne virus was soon recognized as a global threat, capable of causing severe teratogenic effects. With the epidemic of microcephaly, we learned that Zika virus can cross the placenta and profoundly affect fetal development, resulting in structural anomalies and functional impairments that may require lifelong care. The partnership and support of Zika Plan facilitated to build and follow the Merg pregnancy and pediatric cohorts to describe the risk, the spectrum, and the evolution of the congenital Zika syndrome. Our investigations have contributed to understanding this syndrome as a spectrum of clinical features that may include vision, swallowing, communication, and neurodevelopment impairments and microcephaly. From the outset, investigators focused on building connections, including with the families of children with congenital Zika syndrome, creating relationships and systems through which those working in the field and those investigating in the lab could share data would be vital to ensuring a timely and sustainable response. Over the last five years, Zika Plan has yielded some of the most robust estimates to date of the absolute risks associated with congenital Zika virus infections and also provided unique insights regarding the prognosis and health needs of children born with congenital Zika syndrome. With close monitoring of the health and development of more than 700 children, the MERGE pediatric cohort represents the largest single cohort study of children with congenital Zika syndrome and is a uniquely valuable resource for understanding this new disease. In parallel, the research of the Zika-IF cohort has provided unique insights into the vertical transmission of Zika virus and the implications of congenital infection for neurodevelopment. Across the whole of Brazil, the Microcephaly Epidemic Research Group facilitated a nationwide consortium of Zika pregnancy and pediatric cohort studies, known as the Zika Brazilian Cohorts Consortium which has supported rapid data sharing to inform Brazilian Ministry of Health policy. Internationally, the Microcephaly Epidemic Research Group has worked closely with a range of international investigators as part of a large-scale international consortia, including not only Zika Plan, but also the European Commission-funded Zika Cohorts Vertical Transmission Study Group and the World Health Organization-led Zika Virus Individual Participant Data Consortium. Engaging with policymakers, public health officials and affected families was prioritized throughout, so that their scientific findings would be expediently translated into evidence-based policy. The group's work informed the Zika-related guidance of the Pan-American Health Organization and the Brazilian Ministry of Health. And in fact, it was largely thanks to the advocacy of the Microcephaly Epidemic Research Group 
that the World Health Organization and the National Health Emergency in Brazil recognize the cluster of microcephaly and other neurologic disorders as a public health emergency of international concern. The scale and dedication of the group's efforts set an important new precedent for how the global scientific community should respond to emerging infectious threats, including today's COVID-19 pandemic. While the Zika virus pandemic has ended, the devastating health and social impact on children with congenital Zika syndrome and their families continue. In looking forward, our top priority as a research team is on understanding how congenital Zika virus infections may influence children's neurodevelopment and behavior as they reach school age and beyond. We hope to continue to work together through our meaningful international partnerships to understand the needs of affected children so that we can better advocate for effective support services for children with congenital Zika syndrome and their families. Thank you, thank you for, for the team at the Fondation Merieux who put together um, this, this film. We put together in total four films, but we will only be sharing one today and the others will go all up on the Zika Plan website. So united we are to fight against Zika. Today's webinar uh, will uh, have the following big themes. It's harnessing technologies, harnessing networks and advancing innovations. So the next session is now on building research and surveillance capacity while addressing knowledge gaps. Um, and uh, the first speaker, I'm very pleased to um, hand over now to Trudy. You already heard her, so I'm very much looking forward to what, uh, what she has to share about READY. Thank you, Trudy. Thanks very much, Annelies. Um, I see my slides are okay. Just a nod is good. Excellent, super. Um, well, thank you, everyone. And um, it's, it's just brilliant to bring all this work we've all done together over the years together. And I can continue some of the themes we've talked about in the opening panel session, which is excellent. So, as Annalise rightly said, this is about actually levering technology, but also um, trying to work across networks and accelerate all of our work and amplifying it by, by sharing between what we do. So. Um, as you heard earlier, we were tasked with bringing all the, the um, consortia together and we established um, READY and our mission was to create um, ability to undertake research during the Zika outbreak, but also um, have capacity in place um, for future preparedness. So the um, whole idea really was to um, in these vast numbers of studies going on across not just um, um, Brazil, obviously, but also across the whole of Latin America and the Caribbean. And so we approached this in, um, in the way that we work generally within the Global Health Network. And we brought to this lots of the approaches we've been already using um, in, in Africa and Asia for, for many years. And, and our whole ethos is about working with frontline healthcare workers, research teams, working in the labs and in clinics and the, with the communities to really uh, talk about what research is and um, think about how you can build research into your everyday um, practice that's in the clinic or how people working in even clinical or diagnostic labs can think um, about taking their work into a more research function. And then we're um, expanding also into areas um, such as, um, particularly with arbovirus, it's obviously with the vector element, which we we'll talk about quite a lot today, I think. So we've worked through a whole re set of approaches um, to really work um, with the very front line and, and try and build in the sense of community of working together from learning from each other. Um, but, but with this overall ethos of trying to embed the abilities to run really first class research in places where perhaps research had never really been um, in place before. And so this has happened through um, well, face-to-face -face activities before we, we we all got into the situation we're in with COVID, but very much face-to-face um, -face with bringing teams together, but um, in a very strong way um, within our um, online platform too. And so um, 
we came into this to lead this work package as the Global Health Network, um, and we've been around for 10 years. And really what we're about is building these communities of practice. So you can see here how, how ready sits amongst um, the over 60 communities of practice we have connected together on the Global Health Network. And it really works in two ways. On one side, all these big organizations like research consortia like the ones you're learning from today but other groups like CEPI and Welcome and the Gates Foundation they've all got hubs on here too and and it's all about sharing best research practice between each other so we as Annalise said quite rightly earlier we get there faster working together and so this is a platform that's built on state-of-the-art technology for doing exactly that for sharing um, and disseminating and engaging and linking up and creating these um, efficiencies by by working together but the other side of the whole platform is about delivering research capacity training and knowledge skills there's nuts and bolts the how to do research and overall this is all happening because uh, our mission is to try and embed research where there is capability lacking and this is about driving equity, actually, because we still know that 90% of the research that happens in the world only benefits 10% of the population. And as we're going to come back to again and again today, you know, Zika was, you know, a tragic event, um, as was Ebola, as in its everyday disease of poverty. But of course, the world has all, has all experienced COVID-19. And maybe one of the small benefits might be that the world has really recognized the importance of research and why we re need to research to be embedded everywhere. And I'm going to come back to this later, but, but this is where we sat, where ready sits and, um, and how it's able to operate in not just within the networks within the Zika EU consortia, but within many, many other wider networks too, all connected together and sharing knowledge across and between them. So back down to the ground and the front line, um, we've, we have so many sort of active and real programs. Um, these workshops we've talked about, we have coordinators that have been appointed through this, um, pro this project um, who, who go into hospitals and work with teams to deliver research capacity training. And we've done some nice things like been twinning with um, the other EU funded networks in, um, in Africa that are um, that are working to address outbreaks too. There's the Alert and Pandora networks. And obviously the Lucifone element um, has been very useful, um, but also sharing on things like arbovirus and, and, and vector biology skills. So too many particular details to go through, but a vast array of activities that have happened face-to-face -face and, um, and delivering skills and, and, um, and training online as well. So just to drill down a little bit on the online training, and this is all up on the platform and you can have a hunt and have a look, um, but it's a really core cool part of what we do. And over the overall uh, Global Health Network, we've delivered over 2 million online research and um, skills training courses to over 5 million learners, uh, five, sorry, 500,000 learners. But the point is that the um, all of these courses were were made available through ready to our um to our community but with within the ready um network we've been able to really focus down on what was needed immediately within the, the uh, zika outbreak and then we've gone beyond that um and as you'll hear and have already heard over the series of meetings we've been having about this and some of the the, the, the ability we can take this forward and focus down on topics like arbovirus, brain infections, the bar syndrome that you're, you're going to hear more about and deliver the specialist courses that have either were knowledge gaps at the start of this or that their knowledge that we've acquired during our research and we've turned that knowledge into courses as um, Tom Solomon and, and the Gillian bar syndrome and co have done so well at, at doing. So this is serving to, um, to train to fill gaps but also to then disseminate the recommendations from our research in the form of training so this is all about communities of practice and a community of practice is where expert practitioners come together to share their know-how and so we've got communities of practice for setting up a study communities of practice for working on um i don't know disease cohort studies um and then all of these overlap together um, in this huge network of networks to share what they've done. And what we've been able to do through Ready, but through the wider connections with the Global Health Network too, is, is really um, take this forward. And this is now sort of moving into the realms of sustainability here and what happens going forward, that 
from these EU consortia, we have some really key projects that have come forward. The Global Vector Hub, Brain Infections Global, the Birth Defects Work, and the Guillain Barr Syndrome particularly has come out from this is a really nice example, I think, of how um, this is able to take the incredible work from all those groups um, and share it very widely and connect them together. And it can, um, it can help raise the profile of the research as it's happening, but it can also help with the dissemination and engagement um, beyond those studies um, and connect people up um, moving forward. Um, Fia Cruz um, for Ready has been really central to all of this um, and is really part of um, a huge ability for us to take this forward beyond these grants from the EU and, and create a sustainable future um, for the whole um, initiative. Um, I'd like to focus down on what I think is potentially the biggest output from our perspective um, from this work, and this is the um, essential research training curricula. So through this uh, already work plan, we set out to do a knowledge gap analysis um, across all the Zika study sites to ask the people working on the Zika studies, what are your uh, individual and institutional gaps in training and skills to, to deliver your studies? So we set out to do that, but at the same time, we were also working with the, with the networks in Africa and asking the same questions across the global health network. So we extended that um, and we also, uh, and we asked these same questions at all the workshops that we were running and all the activities we're doing everywhere. So, so we, we ran a much broader knowledge gap analysis and we asked a whole range of researchers um, and healthcare workers across the communities we worked in, what are your individual barriers to doing, health research uh, uh, what do you need to fix them and um and from that we, we our goal was to try and conclude an essential set of uh, skills that you would want to be able to impart to any team who were going to take a quality undertake a quality research study so from that first round of the knowledge gap analysis we were able to come up with a, a delphi pro protocol and the delphi is where you, we effectively you take your um, hypothesis uh, curricula, take it back to this um, panelists, which were a group stakeholders from across um, uh, funders, uh, research organizations, the community, the research uh, community themselves. And then you say, is this the set of courses that could you deliver this? It would certainly impart the level of skills that you'd need to run a study. So we did two rounds of the Delphi, and then we worked with WHO TDR to, um, to run two workshops. The first workshop went back over all the data and our methodology with a, with a large group of people to say, have we uh, used the right methodology here? And, um, and, and do you agree with these findings? And then the second workshop, having now got our central curricula, the, sec the, the second and last workshop, which we ran just last month in February, um, took this back to the whole community to say, okay, here is the curricula, how do we now implement it? And so the outcome of this now um, is that we have um, an essential research training curricula um, that's been developed through this really strong process. We had 7,000 people take part in this process and we are now um, working with um, organizations like Gates and the Wellcome Trust and also WHO TDR to try and um, work out how can we can develop toolkits to take this forward. It's going to be a, a report that um, will be put out through TDR, but also a paper um, that obviously um, is largely a result of these three Z consortia and all the work we've done here. And it means it's a curriculum that anybody can use and implement. And so the idea is that any group planning a research training um, project can use this curricula as a framework and if you know knowing that if they include all elements of this curricula then they are going to be able to uh, really set up um, fully um, skilled teams and it covers areas you know not just the normal um, belts and braces of designing a study and data management and, and safety and ethics and quality but it also includes things like community engagement and finance and project management you know all those skills you really need to run a, a good quality study and back to our original objective with everything we do about enabling research in places where evidence is missing here is a set of skills that can assure quality safety and ethical standards and this and security that the project can be run successfully so for us a huge 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 output from this whole piece of work so the, um, 
the collaborations that we've built through this project have just been transformational for us and um, and looking forward now to what happens in the future and thinking about a sustainable home for ready and um, we were really delighted to sign an mou with fear cruise um two years ago um, and through that as well fear cruise have a hub on the global health network because they want to um work more widely outside of brazil as well so fear cruise will um be the um you know the supporting organization behind ready going forward um, which puts it firmly the leadership in the south and where it should be and not from oxford um, and can can continue the regional leadership and wider network and then equally um having a fear cruise hub um, on the global health network alongside ready we can further um, keep working to link up everything with all sorts of other projects and make sure we've got that um you know, networks of networks and amplification of knowledge sharing and all these things we're aiming to achieve. And um, just call out again to this research uptake piece that one of the elements of this is about taking the findings from the Zika studies and um, we're slotting this into a project we're doing with Welcome about research uptake and looking at how you can look at the situation that um, we, you know, Thomas was really referring to earlier, where studies often end with a publication um, and it's difficult to, to move beyond that. And we need to incentivize investigators to and their teams to take the recommendations from their research and turn them into something useful that you can um, translate to the community and can be taken into policy and practice. An example of that on the platform is the Guillain-Barre syndrome recommendations um, that so beautifully come from that work. And working with the um, Zika finding tools, we want to do the same for Zika and pull all the recommendations that have come through and put them into some really usable formats that um, communities and healthcare workers can take forward. Um, so this is a really key success as well that we've, we're able to move ready forward beyond um, beyond um, this consortia and have a long um, sustainable future within the Fear of Cruise Foundation. Another key element was um, showing that um, lots of these projects could go on themselves into the future and so there's been numerous um developments beyond um beyond this project that have led to many many other grants um the uh, the global vector hub was funded the guillain Barr syndrome team have been sec very successful as you've heard um brain infections global um we've also heard from quite a lot over the last um series of meetings and and there's been different awards awarded to um several different groups coming out of this and and particularly around some of the work that's that's come from from ready um what i really wanted to call out was how some of the really junior teams who've never won awards before um have been awarded grants for um either doing particular pieces of research or even running their own workshops and sort of you know train the trainer and further pushing out that expertise and sharing their knowledge which is just really heartening to see um, so just to finish off, um, I just want to really show how, um, which was which was great to pick up in this question that we had um, at the beginning in the panel. So as soon as the COVID outbreak came along, we put a hub up on the Global Health Network called the Research Implementation Hub. We divided that into all the different types of research that you need to happen in an outbreak. And I think this is an important point that we've made, we've tried to make all the way through that often capacity development, data sharing, um, research regulations are all focused on clinical trials and obviously in an outbreak clinical trials are often much later along and what we need right at the beginning is these immediate disease characterization surveillance diagnostics and observational studies and and solving all those problems especially around consent and, and moving data very quickly um, and, and standardizations and you know, you know, Tom covered lots and um, Thomas covered lots of those earlier, but these really important early points. So you need all types of research to happen in the very same instance, including obviously behavior and social science as well to understand perceptions and, 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 and really what's going on in the health systems. And, and hopefully in a very short point, you'll have clinical trials to do on your drugs and vaccines but also you need research onto your public health interventions as well. So we collected all of that together in the COVID hub and it was and it was pushed to be led by the three regional coordination centers that we have in the global health network, one of which is FIA Cruise, and of course that's the Ready Network. And it's been remarkable um, how the, the uptake of this and the 
everything that's come from it in terms of studies that have been designed, standards that have been shared, groups that have taken part in research that wouldn't have been able to, um, bringing, um, say, the ASARIC standards um, to this, and um, making sure that studies knew about things like solidarity and um, some of the other big platform trials that are going on, and really all the time trying to bring that equity who, who could take part in research and making sure research benefits everywhere. So this was truly ready responding as it was supposed to um, to an outbreak, and we're just absolutely um, humbled really by the uh, by the impact that this had. And, and what that really um, comes back to is this point um, I, I made at, at the beginning today about if, if you want to have true preparedness and, and you want to mitigate a pandemic, obviously you want to prevent an outbreak becoming a pandemic. And the only way to do that is to have research capacity everywhere where a new um, emergent pathogen might appear and be able to firstly identify and then characterize that in situ with local teams and not having to helicopter them in, which will create you know, devastating delays, which will obviously enable the, the pathogen to escape. And then we all know where that leads us. Um, so very much um, ready led us to be able to, to, to deliver the response that, that, that we did and was very much part of that, which is really delightful to report. So just to finish off, um, we, um, we will continue to work through READY um, in the Latin American and Caribbean re region under the leadership of FIA Cruz. Um, it's been fantastic working across all three partnerships over all these years. Um, and obviously some of them still continue for a little while. Um, we're incredibly grateful to the European Union for the funding, um, but it's also we've, we've also leveraged funding from many of our other partners uh, for our work with READY because We've utilised the Global Health Network and that's funded by the Gates Foundation, Welcome and some other partners too. Um, so it's important to, to call that out. But overall, um, the people we need to thank are all the community of, of, of participants, the community and, and the research community that, that make ready what it is and the many um, hundreds of thousands of people that have taken part. So thank you, everyone, and I'm happy to take any questions. Um, as frequently said, birth defects were the hallmark for Zika infections, um, but we also need to know we only discovered the signal uh, when there was enough, a, a, a significant number of persons infected, right? So um, uh, Africa may have had, we know that Africa had Zika for decades, maybe it was missed as a signal, maybe because uh, Zika infections were just anecdotal. But maybe also because of um, of, uh, of suboptimal birth defect surveillance. Hence, the idea came up to develop an easy to use app to facilitate uh, the early identification of global birth defects. And now over to Helen Dolk, who led this very important work. Helen Dolk is a uh, is professor at at Ulster University. So uh, um, over to you, Helen. Thank you. Thank you very much, Annalise. Um, and hello, everybody. I'm sorry I can't actually see you, but I know you're there. Um, I'll just share my screen. Okay, so I'm, um, as Annalise said, going to talk to you about um, how we developed the Global Birth Defect app to harness uh, mobile technology to develop birth defect surveillance globally. Uh, more than 5 million babies are born every year globally with major congenital anomalies. Um, I'll be using congenital anomalies and birth defects as interchangeable terms for the purposes of this uh, talk. And they're across all the different organ systems. And at the top there, you see about 10% um, would be normally nervous system defects, which include, of course, microcephaly, a major feature of the congenital Zika um, syndrome. Um, we know that uh, 3,617 cases were officially reported to uh, PAHO during the main uh, Zika epidemic. Um, and uh, uh, you saw a wonderful film of the work done by Merg on congenital Zika syndrome um, just earlier in this, in this webinar. Congenital anomalies are the fourth leading cause of mortality under five years of age, 
and they're rising in relative importance as more work is being done on other causes, but not so much on congenital anomalies. So if we're to meet the Sustainable Development Goal 3.2 by 2030, end preventable deaths of newborns and under five children, we have to do something about birth defects in terms of both preventing them and improving survival, improving treatment and survival. But despite their very important role as a cause of uh, child mortality, most children with congenital anomalies survive the first five years of life, as is indeed true, as you saw in the film, of congenital Zika syndrome. A huge impact on individuals, families, and communities with multidisciplinary health and social care needs. And as said very well in the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, Disability results from the interaction between persons with impairments and attitudinal and environmental barriers that hinder full and effective participation in society on an equal basis with others. So we have a huge agenda to work on with congenital anomalies uh, worldwide. We have to remember that birth defects are preventable there's a host of maternal risk factors known to cause uh, congenital anomalies, of which Zika and maternal infections in general are one. But um, uh, we're not doing very much about actually working on what we know to prevent birth defects or doing enough research on finding out the unknown, presently unknown causes of birth defects. So. Um, in 2010, the World Health uh, Assembly, recognizing this situation, uh, put out a birth defects resolution, agreed a birth defects resolution to redress the limited focus to date on prevention, care and support, especially in low and middle income countries. And they recommended strengthening registration and surveillance systems so that we have more information on what's happening and the causes of birth defects and tracking the success of preventive efforts where they exist. And these recommendations were really reinforced by the Zika epidemic. The Zika epidemic was a case in point of where uh, it was clear that registration and surveillance needs to be strengthened, as indeed Annalise said in her introduction. At the core of surveillance is congenital anomaly diagnosis and recording. It needs to be accurate, that is specific to the defect and complete. And this is particularly important in low resource areas where the uh, expertise to diagnose and to describe accurately and code the congenital anomalies is lacking. So that really hampers the potential for surveillance. So the WHO recently uh, revised its quick reference handbook for birth defect surveillance um, that you can see there. But our task uh, was to develop an app and use the potential for mobile technology across um, uh, um, low and middle income countries to be able to describe and code better externally visible congenital anomalies at the time of birth or soon after for use by non-experts um, for potential use offline, so it doesn't require Wi-Fi um, to, to be used. And this um, app is now available in the, uh, both the Apple and the Google Play stores, and it's available in English, Portuguese, and Spanish. We set up for um, developing this app an international com committee of experts from around the world on congenital anomaly surveillance. And that was a very important part of validating the, um, uh, the app as a surveillance tool. And the app, in the end, during the development process, we realized that it needed to, um, uh, to exist in two versions. The basic version is a reference version. It's like a lookup tool um, that gives images and uh, international classification disease codes and descriptions of 85 major externally visible anomalies and nine syndromes, 
also neonatal examination videos and links to relevant materials. The surveillance version allows, in addition, um, the recording of data, data uh, that will uh, help interpret the diagnosis of the, uh, of the baby and to take a photo for the test version of the, uh, of the app and to upload that data to a server where the a secure server where the uh, surveillance center can then download the data again and match it with other data that they have on the baby. So it looks like this. This is the home page. You tap on birth defects. Um, the, the user registers beforehand, but taps on birth defects. Um, comes to a baby that flips back to front very easily. And the user can tap on the area that is involved when they see the baby. And um, tap on the area of interest. In this, uh, in this case, the arm, then they're um, presented with a number of different options of types of anomaly. Um, they can select the type of anomaly that seems most appropriate and find the term, the code, and the description, etc. The app includes differential diagnosis tips between similar anomalies. And for the surveillance version, as I said, uh, data can be recorded and uploaded to a server. For microcephaly, very important for congenital Zika syndrome, there are head circumference measurement videos and tables to teach people how to diagnose um, microcephaly, how to record it, and a microcephaly calculator so that when one puts in the gestational age and the head circumference and the sex of the baby, the um, uh, app tells you whether this is indeed small for gestational age and qualifies as microcephaly or as severe microcephaly. There's a special module on congenital Zika syndrome itself, which points out the different anomalies that are associated. Microcephaly are the brain anomalies, eye abnormalities, um, uh, contractures, etc., And encourages the recording of evidence of uh, maternal or fetal Zika infection. And importantly, we worked with our partners on uh, in the Zika Plan project with uh, Trudy Lang and her team at the Global Health Network to establish the Global Birth Defects uh, Member Hub. And that is the home, if you like, of the app, because uh, we've been able to put up on that hub now uh, instructional videos on how to use the app, on how to register for the app, on how to navigate through the app. And this means that we can really build on the, um, on the instructional value and the training value of the app. So the legacy then is that we've taken some steps towards exploiting the huge potential of mobile health for congenital anomaly surveillance, diagnosis and care in low resource areas. And there's a lot more now that can be done. Um, the, uh, basic version of the app has been downloaded in 38 countries. Uh, it's there ready for the next Zika ep epidemic. Um, the surveillance version of the app is currently being tested in different surveillance um, and research contexts, mainly in Africa, in Kenya and in South Africa and soon in uh, Burkina Faso. For example, in relation to medication safety in pregnancy, antiretrovirals and anti-malarials. Uh, anti but this testing was delayed by uh, the COVID uh, pandemic, so it's it's currently ongoing. Uh, the G, uh, the app will be taken over by the WHO. We hope in the next um, few years to form part of the birth defect surveillance toolkit. So we're doing some work at the moment to make sure that it's entirely compatible with the quick quick reference handbook. Uh, and then we have as well the uh, Global Birth Defects Member Hub now on the Global Health Network, which is so important to mainstream birth defect surveillance and prevention as part of global public health to really give it much greater visibility. You're going to hear next from uh, Professor Ieda Orioli on the RELAMP network, which is the congenital anomaly network that's been set up as part of Zika plan uh, in uh, Latin America. But we now also, um, uh, consequent on all this work, have 
funding for a new network in Africa where there's very much less activity on congenital anomalies, an African network for congenital anomaly surveillance, prevention and care that's led by uh, Ugandan partners. And um, that's uh, an MRC funded seed grant that has come directly from this project also. So I'd like to thank, of course, the European Union for the funding for this project and thank you for your attention. I'm quite happy to um, answer questions later on in the session. Thank you, thank you, Helen. And it really shows you've really shown the legacy beyond beyond Zika. You also have shown what what Trudy also you know highlighted. It's not only about publications, but about uh, tangible outcomes of, of of this project. And you know, and being part of a WHO toolkit may have you know a decade decades long long legacy so so thank you for that work it's a pleasure now uh, to to um, highlight to introduce well you know most most of you know her Yeda Orioli who is both from Argentina and Brazil and she was really intricately involved in birth defect surveillance and we were so we felt so honored that she was willing to join Zika plan in 2016 with the objective to just to really strengthen birth defect surveillance in the Latin American region. Over to Yida, thank you. Uh, and just unmute yourself. Oh, uh, sorry, but... Um, <laughs> Very good, train. I can hear you now, good. Are you seeing me? Yes, we see you also. Okay. And are you seeing my screen? Not yet. I'm not yet. Okay. Let me then see. Oh, sorry for that. Okay. Okay. And now share screens here. Excellent. Very okay. good. Sorry. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much for the opportunity to present the RELANC, the Latin American Network for Congenital Morphomation Surveillance. In 2015, when Zika virus epidemic was linked to microcephaly in Brazil, we want to know the microcephaly prevalence in Brazil before 2015 to confirm the epidemic and to calculate the Zika virus risk for the pregnant woman. And two flaws hampered the correct answer. Sinask, the Brazilian live bird system underreported the microcephaly, showing around five cases per 100,000 live birds. The other flaw was the ICLANC, a Latin American hospital-based network with good coverage of a good report of birth defects, but with only one hospital in Northeast of Brazil. In 2015, besides the ICLANC network, there were 15 population-based registries working on 10 countries. However, they are not networked like the ICBDSR, the clearinghouse, networking 43 registries around the world, or the Eurocat covering the European registries or the National Bird Effects Prevention Network in the United States of America. So, to increase the Latin American surveillance of bird effects, we proposed to network the population-based registries and the Eclanc hospital network to provide validated and updated basic frequencies for the entire region. We knew about Zika virus and microcephaly on October 2015. 
In October 2016, we succeeded in financing the project. And it was proposed to the Latin American registries. They accepted it. So during 2017, we de developed the regulative and constitutive norms. We did the uh, data sharing pilot in 2018. In 2019, there was full data sharing and the database was consolidated. Last year until now, we published the network construction and the first results. And uh, now we are finishing the web page setup to permit the public use of the relink data. This, this short time to set up relink was only possible due the Eclank network of people interested in bird effects since 1967. The traditional Eclank annual meetings, the Eurocat and ICBDSR previous experiences in networking, and to our Zika plant team, mainly Helen Dog and John Morris. Krilank shares around 3 million and a half birds a year. Most of birds came from the Brazilian system, but also national registries like Paraguay, Argentina, Chile, Costa Rica, and the regional like Nuevo Leon in Mexico, Nicaragua, Cali, and Bogota in Colombia, Maule in Chile, Sao Paulo in Brazil. The white dots show the countries where there, were, there are Eclank hospitals. So from Bolivia, Peru, and Venezuela, the information on bird effects came through the Eclank network to relate. Three national registries, Cuba, Panama, and Colombia, are not yet sending data to Relunk. They need the Relunk to be recognized by international health agencies like WHO and FAHO to share, that, to share data with other countries. The first three years analysis show heterogeneity among the registries in the prevalence rates of two birds, congenital anomalies, microcephaly, Down syndrome, and other defects. Most of the heterogeneities result from differences in rules or quality of registration. Both are important to data interpretation. Our plans to relunk concern prevention and control of bird effects. We want to focus on well known avoidable bird effects, all caused environmentally and subjected to control mainly worsened by poverty and poor health care, like, for example, the six examples of environmentally caused microcephaly, the gestational diabetes mellitus, cytomegalovirus, toxoplasmosis, alcohol use during pregnancy, Zika, and rubella virus. We pretend to develop research methodology for environmental causes of bird effects. Remember that genetic causes are permanent, but environmental ones are punctual in time and harder to study. 
Foment Epidemiological Research on Maternal Diseases or Habits. Promote codification using ICD-10 codes out of the chapter 17, since, for example, the STOSH infections are not coded inside the bird effect chapter. Increase interaction mainly with international organisms, WHO, FAHO, Ministries of Health, since they are responsible for implementing our suggested policies, health policies. For us, the legacy of the Zika plan is the relunk itself and its power to detect new epidemics faster and to prevent and control bird effects increasing, increasing the research in the area. Um, our gratitude to the European community through the Zika plan leaders and the figures of Annelise and Raman, Brazil institutions that sponsor these projects, and our ICLANC and RELANC team. Thank you very much. Yeah, for the questions. Thank you so much um, to the three speakers. Um, it's, it's open for any questions also from the panelists. If panelists want to ask or comment, please just turn on your video. But I have one question already. And it's from Sonia Leonhardt, who says she's wondering if uh, the birth defects app, besides being able to differentiate between different types of birth defects, is also able to capture the underlying causes. So, for example, torch versus other causes. Over to Helen. And please unmute yourself when you do answer and turn on your videos as well. Can you see me? I'm having some technical difficulties here. It's disappeared from my screen. But anyway, if you can see me, that's great. Um, uh, no, it's um, it it doesn't do that. It has some advice on congenital maternal infections um, and links to um, other documents where um, more information can be found on, for example, the WHO guides on congenital syphilis and congenital rubella syndrome. Um, so it links out to uh, guidance for laboratory um, uh, verification of infections, but it doesn't actually incorporate it. It could in the future, and there is great potential, not necessarily in the one app, but in a, in a series of apps um, to incorporate more of that sort of information that can be used diagnostically. But this app is really more for surveillance use, not for diagnostic use. As a first step, what we weren't trying to do is to get in the way of the referral pathway and the proper diagnosis of the child by experts. We're not we're not trying to promote non-expert diagnosis of congenital anomalies. It's really a surveillance tool more than a diagnostic tool as part of the clinical care pathway. But there are huge needs to develop clinical pathway tools and that we're discussing at the moment, but that's not what the app presently is. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, anyone from the panelists, a question or a comment? to Ieda on birth defect surveillance, Helen or Trudy. Tr Trudy, I have, a, I have a question to you. So, so um, you know, the money will now end in the, on literally the 31st of March um, for, for READY. Um, yes, you have said there is funding, you know, through, through the Gates Foundation, et cetera. But, but how would you, how, how do you think this kind of work is sustainable beyond now the current EU funding that, that has now, is now coming to an end. Uh, and unmute yourself. You'd have thought after a year of Zoom, we'd have lost that. Um, so because we've, we've drawn 
ready from the get-go within the wider global health network and then taking the, the subsequent step to place it within FIO Cruz. This just forms this falls within our ongoing sustainability plan and this is um we're pivoting the leadership of the global health network south so we have leadership centers in latin america asia and africa and and we have a, a really comprehensive uh, consortia funding model to take us forward for another 10 years and so ready will sit within that and we want ready and the and the, the global health network southern um latin american leadership team to be writing and winning their own funding and and working with other networks and so we um so it, it it does have a very secure future but i have to say though that it's probably a good point to say that the the difficulty always is is that it's very difficult to get funding to support research infrastructure and capacity building because it it falls out of the usual stalls of um of funding it's very difficult because it's the the impact that we're bringing isn't running a particular study and so for most funding research institutions it's very difficult to fund the work we do and it's a constant battle so i'm saying this like, oh yes we've got our funding completely fine but it's really really difficult and all the organizations we work with are very supportive and they absolutely recognize our impact but they do not have funding streams that say research structures infrastructures and innate research enabling and as we've just learned we need those research capacities in place and so my call to the funders is you know really to get together and have some funding streams that are absolutely around long-term building lasting capable teams that doesn't necessarily get hung on one research study because that's too short term Yes, indeed, most most funders, you know, fund hypothesis driven uh, research questions rather rather than setting up uh, networks or infrastructures or surveillance for that matter for, you know, also for YEDA. And often it has to be governments that that then uh, then step in and, and fund uh, these kinds of issues. Helen and Yida, I have another question for you. Ha, ha, you mentioned that you want to bring your experience from Latin America to Africa. Can you elaborate more on that? You know, what can we learn from Latin America, but what is also different? You know, where do we need another network or another approach for Africa versus Latin America? Um, well, Latin America was a little different in that it started with a lot more in that, as Ieda was describing, it started with a number of national re and regional registries and a, and a hospital based network that's been going for a long time, whereas Africa has a lot um, less going on at the moment um, of, of very limited surveillance projects currently working, although there are some across African countries but they haven't um, worked together in a network. So um, whereas um, Latin America, there was some networking, but between hospitals. So um, it's very important to use the experience of Eurocat in Europe and, and uh, Latin America, just the concept of networking and how much power each center can get from being linked to the others, from discussing with others. There's far too little expertise in any one country and we need to share expertise and share resources in order to go forward and also share data. Um, as Ieda said, um, the, the pilot of the data sharing in Latin America showed the great heterogeneity in data being collected by the different systems. And that really helps, and, and it's the same in Europe, if one was to do the, the uh, show the same graph in Europe. And that really helps systems to think about their own characteristics, how they're collecting data, how that should be interpreted, um, what are the real differences between countries in congenital anomaly prevalence, and which ones are to do with diagnostic systems and reporting systems. So it's, it's really helpful to come together and compare data and discuss and to share the very different expertise that um, exists in, in, uh, in the different countries. So um, then there are other aspects and, and we're hoping to learn a lot from the, the recent pathway of RELAMP 
in terms of setting up uh, memoranda of agreements, in terms of data sharing mechanisms, um, how to put together the, the um, data manual, all those things that uh, are required for a, for a networked approach. There's a, there's a huge uh, wish in the African network to, to start with a high degree of data harmonization. Um, and in a sense, it's easier to harmonize data when you're starting than when you've already um, gone down a load of different pathways and now you have to <laughs> harmonize it after the fact. So it's a, it's a good moment really to start about, to start thinking about harmonized data collection. So um, there are many ways in which we can learn from RELAMC, the, the RELAMC experience and from the EuroCAT and American and other experiences um, before that. Well, 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 thank you. And, and so I hope that you will have a lot of um, meetings in the future, unfortunately not funded now through SIGA plan, but through other uh, modes, including WHO, because WHO has a vested interest. And, and you know, one of the learnings from SIGA, from the SIGA epidemic was indeed, we need to strengthen birth defect surveillance. And thank you for addressing this need. I have um, one comment I read here under the chat from Michael, Sal, <laughs> I don't know which country he's from, but he says an important lesson from the past was the US collaborative perinatal project from the 1950s to 60s. So designed to understand pathways involved in cerebral palsy, epilepsy, intellectual disability and blindness, the group saved maternal blood. They discovered how important congenital rubella was and the critical importance of not only detecting severe forms of the spectrum of this virus. I think this is a very good reminder. As we all know, initially we were all biased towards the, the phenomenon of microcephaly and, and, and because of the three Zika consortia, we've really learned the full spectrum of disease, but it's also only because we have enhanced our surveillance. So thank you to Michael for his comment. Uh, with that, um, I think, uh, is there any burning question here or any comment, Trudy, you would like to have like a, like a final word here before we have a five minute um, biological break? No, thank you. I think it's, um, it's been such a great session and it's been uh, particularly excellent to work with Helen on this because uh, she, this was a, one of the most significant outputs for us, I think, from this is without this program, we wouldn't have brought our work together. And, and it's same is true for um, the Brain Infections Global and the Vector Hub. You know, this has really been what it's been about for us is joining up these projects and, and making everybody's impact greater by, by sharing this more widely. And, and I think finally, just to add that last piece of my hammering the message home about um, needing to have completely dedicated support for truly embedding research competencies in every area of healthcare delivery. And that would be my, my call out to the funders for, for that. Thank you. And I, I want to encourage everyone here to go to the Global Health Network a website where you literally can find everything what's presented today and what, what Trudy mentioned, including all the training resources, the communities of practice, but also the Birth Effect app um, and also the Vector Hub that, that you just mentioned and, and various other networks and, and resources, but also the publications of Zika Plan. So Zika Plan is also hosted in the on the Global Hub Network uh, website. So so I think um, I please do go and this is this is our legacy. The website is the legacy. The le website will remain. I hope. <laughs> and and with that, all the resources. So welcome back after our short break. Um, it is um, we now move to the next session, which is really on advancing innovation by co collaboration that will also impact low resource settings. It is my pleasure to hand over to Rosanna Peeling, who led the Zika plan work package on setting up a diagnostics platform for evaluation of novel diagnostics. And um, I'm very pleased that Rosanna will also chair this session. Over, over to you. And the first talk, in fact, is by Rosanna. Thank you, Annalise, and um, it's, uh, it, it gives me great pleasure to present our work on behalf of our um, uh, work package. Um, so let me share my screen and go to presentation mode. Okay, so um, 
what I what I like to do is to just uh, go over a little bit of the background and then uh, what we're going to uh, what we did actually in the last few years. Um, I think very early on in the in the Zika outbreak, we realized that the diagnosis of active Zika uh, virus infection has been hampered by very extensive cross reactivity. Uh, of uh, IgM tests among members of the Flavi family, uh, Flavi virus family, such as uh, uh, cross reactivity with dengue, with uh, West Nile, etc. And so, um, as WHO urged companies and uh, academic researchers to develop more sensitive and more specific seeker assays, uh, the number one priority that um, a lot of this uh, test developers identified is having access to well characterized samples and clinical trial sites uh, for the development and evaluation of the seeker tests that we need, uh, especially for identifying active infection in pregnant women. So our work package was to uh, support the development of novel seeker diagnostic tests at, by assembling a virtual biobank with access to well-characterized specimens uh, and uh, a network of clinical trial sites so that we could do evaluations of the tests that are developed. Um, and we wanted uh, to harmonize procedures and the governance for all the biobanking sites and uh, the protocols for evaluation so that we could accelerate uh, the validation uh, of the performance of these tests and have them put into use without delay. Now, why virtual biobank? Um, this actually was uh, based on a decision of the group uh, when I presented to them my experience of um, setting up bow banks within uh, WHO TDR for diseases of uh, poverty. And so uh, each, we ended up with three models, uh, a centralized model where all the specimens are in uh, one physical bow bank. Um, and that is the model for our TB one. And that's based on the uh, specific recommendation of our TB advisory group, as well as the resources available from the Gates Foundation. And then for dengue and malaria, we ended up with a regional hub based on our advisory group for malaria. And then um, for other diseases where we don't have very many resources, in fact, we decided to have a, a decentralized or just a network of biobanking sites where all the specimens are stored and characterized at the site of collection. So what experience have we learned from you know, nine years of doing this? is that although the single biobank is uh, really useful in terms of having a, a single point of a very simple infrastructure, a single point for stem, uh, assembling uh, uh, evaluation panels for distribution of specimens needed for development, it's got great disadvantages in that it's very expensive to maintain uh, and also because of having to ship specimens from all over the world to that central bank, there's a lot of very complicated paperwork involved um, and a risk of ship, losing shipments or loss of the specimen quality during shipping. And that's happened uh, with some of the shipments that we have. And also the paperwork took a long time uh, between the size of collection and our bank and WHO TDR. And um, it was a, a, a big nightmare and uh, it resulted in a lot of delay. Now, down to the uh, last model, the, the um, decentralized model or the virtual network, it's in fact, we found it to be the most sustainable because uh, very little uh, uh, shipment is involved. Uh, in fact, um, uh, only specimens going out to uh, developers uh, to, for, uh, helping with the development of tests. Nothing is uh, uh, has to be shipped for evaluations because all the tests are being shipped to the sites. Um, and we found also over time that we've actually built country capacity for doing their own evaluations, not only for Zika, but for other diseases, diagnostics for other diseases. And we could use the sites for ongoing um, uh, quality assurance of the 
tests that arrive in the country are uh, or being used. The disadvantage of that, of course, is that uh, you have to really make sure that all the sites maintain the same quality standards, use the same uh, 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 essays for uh, as a gold standard and for a characterizing test. There may be sample heterogeneity from site to site, which has to be taken into account. And also um, there's uh, shipping of tests to different sites and they need to have a very efficient way of uh, receiving the samples so that the test quality is not compromised during the shipment. So having decided on the virtual bank for, for Seeker, uh, we looked at the guiding principles because this represents our values in uh, setting up uh, biobanks. And we're guided by a number of interna international treaties that looks at a fair and equitable sharing of um, benefits. Uh, it, the Nogoya Protocol started uh, for was started with for biodiversity, but it's now been adopted for for many things, including uh, um, biobanks. And of course, uh, we we have the Declaration of Helsinki that really protects the rights of individuals, the autonomy of individuals to uh, decline to uh, share their specimen or not, um, and also uh, protection of privacy uh, and confidentiality for individuals as well as uh, for communities or collectives. And because of the uh, virtual bank, we could actually have um, the ownership retained uh, at the at the site of uh, collection or by the countries themselves, and but overall we want to have transparency of how we acquire the specimens, how we give access to the specimens, and uh, be accountable uh, to all the stakeholders. Now, for for uh, bio banking for epidemic preparedness, uh, what we need are two things besides what I've just said is the speed. We need to quickly uh, put a, a, a network together. And for this, we actually have really good uh, collaboration uh, with uh, conversations with the Sika Alliance and Sika Action, and especially uh, Xavier um, in his experience with the European archive, uh, right, virus archive. That's been very useful for us to think about how we would set up and operate um, this bank. And so with that, we uh, put in a, quite a simple governance uh, where we have a steering committee giving all oversight to the entire uh, operation, but a scientific committee to decide uh, the requests uh, on the request for uh, uh, specimens, as well as um, uh, how much to give in terms of access, uh, and also decide on the evaluation protocols uh, and also making sure that uh, all the um, uh, requests for specimens are based on very sign, uh, found uh, scientific experiments uh, to develop uh, uh, the test that we need. And all this is, um, uh, as I said, uh, have, uh, all the specimens have informed consent. And uh, so we actually had a call uh, for uh, size as well as uh, the sites within our diagnostic work package. And, um, and so here is the network. And uh, you could see on the left-hand side, uh, we have um, uh, the London School, we have University of Le uh, North Carolina. That's part of our network, uh, our work package. Uh, we have uh, Cuba um, and Colombia. Senegal, they're all part of our work package. We later on took on um, the National Institute for Quality Control in Brazil uh, for uh, evaluations of tests. And also as part of our uh, network, uh, the Fondation Mirio in France, uh, the Swiss Tropical Institute, the Institute for Tropical Medicine in Belgium. And then additionally, we took on three sites in Asia, mainly for additional specimens uh, for, uh, for chikungunya, and other uh, uh, diseases that um, may actually cross, uh, cross cross reactions 
uh, to uh, the test. So we wanted to have a very well, um, very robust challenge panel to make sure the specificity of the seeker tests are uh, as optimal as possible. And so in total, we have these uh, 12 sites uh, that could actually help with the uh, development and evaluation of the test. Now, what's the um, legacy? So we, um, when, when COVID came um, uh, in January and, uh, of last year, uh, we, at the head of the Africa CDC, John Nkengesong, uh, uh, actually reached out to me and said, uh, we need uh, training uh, for how to diagnose uh, uh, COVID and, um, and could we organize uh, some workshops on training as well as look into whether it's possible to set up a biobank similar to what I've set up uh, for Sika. And, um, and so um, I immediately talked with uh, Xavier, with Annalise, uh, and um, and uh, people at WHO, and it, by February we were organizing uh, workshops for countries to, uh, for COVID diagnosis and started the discussion on biobanks, and um, and by August we've already set up a biobanking mechanism for Af the Africa CDC, and uh, and as part of that um, they also incorporated research into. Uh, their biobanking uh, network so that uh, right now there's also uh, an institute for pathogen genomics that's been set up um, uh, just recently um, and, and funded. And so this is a, a really, really useful way to think about how within a very short time they adopted our, our car, uh, governance, our framework, how we organize ourselves. And right now is for COVID, but uh, we're already looking at other diseases of epidemic potential that is uh, um, special to Africa, such as uh, um, meningitis uh, in the meningitis belt of Africa, as well as um, cholera, et cetera. And so uh, there'll be different uh, networks set up for, for different diseases. In the meantime, um, after Zika was uh, no longer uh, a matter of international concern, UNICEF and USAID was very disappointed that we, um, the, the, the development of uh, more sensitive and specific Zika tests had um, not been continued beyond that because a lot of diagnostic companies that were developing these tests after the outbreak was over decided to drop the projects. So um, UNICEF and USAID use an advanced purchase mechanism, uh, advanced purchase commitment mechanism to try to incentivize the continued development of specific seeker tests. And, and they approach us to use our seeker plan, our biobank network to evaluate tests that uh, fulfill their criteria for, for performance. And, um, and, and this evaluation, the results of this evaluation will be used to inform UNICEF uh, procurement for these tests. And right now, um, there are a number of tests, both multiplex tests as well as uh, seeker um, uh, tests. Uh, for IgM and IgG that are being piloted uh, with funding from UNICEF and USAID uh, for surveillance in, in a, a small number of countries right now. And in the meantime, for COVID, um, I've been sharing our uh, framework and governance with uh, FIND, uh, the Foundation for uh, Innovative New Diagnostics and WHO uh, for the development of biobanking networks for diseases of epidemic potential beyond COVID. And FIND also has an interest in um, uh, biobanking network for neglected tropical diseases. So this is, has been our legacy. And I must say that um, I have an enormous number of people to thank uh, all the members of our um, uh, work package uh, and also a, a special call out to uh, Debbie Boras from the Global Health Impact Group who organized a lot of this work uh, together with me and our sites in Asia as well as um, uh, UNICEF uh, USAID for their um, uh, 
continuous support of our, our network and people at the London School at our International Diagnostic Center. And, um, and last but not least, uh, to thank the e European Union for funding uh, for our project. Thank you very much. So with that, I like to stop sharing and um, uh, and could I call on uh, Dr. Bart Jacobs to um, give his presentation on the uh, Guillain-Barre syndrome, uh, seeker related studies and preparations for future pandemics. Uh, Dr. Jacobs is uh, from the Erasmus uh, University Medical Center uh, in the Netherlands. Over to you, Dr. Jacobs. Okay, thank you. Um, can you see my presentation? Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you um, as well for the uh, invitation to present uh, the work on the Guillain-Barre syndrome uh, that has been um, investigated as part of the uh, Zika plan uh, consortium. So just as a very short introduction to this disorder uh, that may probably be familiar to many of you, but not to all. Um, it's a severe inflammation of the peripheral nerves causing uh, paralysis of the limbs, but also of the cranial muscles and also of the respiratory muscles. It's a rare disease uh, with a frequency of one to two per hundred thousand per year. So um, that means that there are about 100,000 new patients um, every year in the world. It is a very diverse uh, clinical presentation and it has a very diverse differential diagnosis. And related to that, there are many uh, diagnostic uh, dilemmas in this disease. About 20% of the patients uh, will develop respiratory failure, sometimes for uh, more than a month, um, and they are ventilated on an ICU. And still 2 to 12% of the patients may die from this disease. Uh, the treatment is with immunoglobulins or with plasma freezes, uh, both expensive treatments that are not uh, available in many countries, as you uh, may realize. And important for uh, the Zika consortium is that it may be triggered by preceding infections such as Zika. And to be honest, I have never heard uh, before about the Zika virus until this publication came out in 2016, where uh, at French Polynesia, an association was suggested between uh, the Zika virus uh, uh, epidemic and the Guillain-Barre syndrome. And immediately that uh, raised many questions um, because it was unsure if this was truly uh, the Guillain-Barre syndrome, considering all the diagnostic uh, dilemmas in this disease. Um, the authors reported an exonal form of the uh, disease, which is unusual for preceding viral infections. Um, there were antibodies detected uh, and there was very little information about the clinical course and outcome of these patients and the impact uh, on society. So in, in 2012, um, we were already um, conducting uh, this study, the International GBS Outcome Study, uh, which is an uh, observational study uh, in patients with the Guillain-Barre syndrome, including all the variants and uh, severity independent of the uh, treatment. And as you can see on the stu study protocol, uh, we are collecting clinical data, treatment data, biosamples, uh, neurophysiology, which is important for the diagnosis, cerebrospinal fluid and DNA. Um, and uh, at the moment when the, uh, the uh, Zika uh, epidemic started, uh, we had included around uh, 1400 uh, patients already. Uh, and since then we have included an additional 500 patients. They are carefully characterized, uh, carefully checked for the diagnosis and for many other uh, important uh, items. And as you can see, uh, when uh, Zika uh, started, uh, we had a fair representation around the world, but especially in uh, South America, um, where the Zika was then ongoing, uh, we had no representation. Important also is that uh, this study is supported by the Inflammatory Neuropathy Consortium. Those are uh, neuromuscular uh, specialists with an expertise in GBS, and we have 
regular uh, meetings uh, and, and part of congresses are also reserved for this uh, for this team. So um, immediately uh, what we could do is uh, share our ICOS protocol with uh, organizations that plan to investigate the relation between Zika and uh, GBS. Um, so I think that was a good thing that we could do uh, right away. Uh, so we sh shared our uh, ICOS protocol with uh, Jim Sefiar from CDC, uh, Carlos Pardo from NEOS, Tom Solomon from Zika Neurology Network, uh, and also with Uma Pata from Sing Health. And in fact, they could start uh, including patients uh, sooner than, uh, than we could start with uh, uh, investigating the relation between uh, Zika and uh, the Guillain-Barre syndrome. So that was dedicated a sub-study within IGOS called uh, the IGOS uh, Zika study. And that was a case control designed uh, study with more specified uh, questions related to Zika. So um, this, this resulted in, an, in an, a very productive collaboration uh, with many uh, members uh, of work group uh, two and four uh, in, in Zika plan. Most of these people I had never met before, uh, and that all resulted in very uh, productive uh, and interesting collaborations. So we were able to, to start this dedicated ICOL Zika case control uh, study, collecting samples from patients in the uh, Zika related uh, areas in the world, uh, and also from, from controls. Um, we also started a collaboration with the Brazilian uh, Neurological Society because we were interested to see what, um, what uh, limitations uh, neuro neurologists experienced during the Zika pandemic when we knew that there were many patients with the Guillain-Barre syndrome in their ICU, for instance. So uh, together with them, we designed a uh, survey uh, to get a better grip on what was going on in, uh, in Brazil. And uh, more than 200 uh, Brazilian neurologists participated in this uh, survey, which was also published. And that made us realize that one of the things that was most urgently needed was a uh, clinical guideline, especially for the diagnosis and the treatment of GBS. Uh, at that time, there were plans already uh, to have an, uh, a guideline developed by the Peripheral Nerve Society, and I was also involved in that already. But that was a rather slow process based on a very uh, strict format um, and that would result in, an, in a very extensive guideline with a lot of systemic uh, literature uh, reviews uh, included in that. Um, uh, and that guideline is, of course, is very uh, valuable for the, for the true uh, uh, experts. But uh, we also wanted to have a guideline that could be used in all hospitals around the world. Also for, uh, for not even neurologists, but just for clinicians that saw a patient with Guillain-Barre syndrome. And for that, we, we developed the first international consensus guideline, which is a very practical guideline, uh, which, which follows a 10 steps uh, uh, approach for the diagnosis and treatment. And this was developed by many GBS experts around the world, but also with many uh, colleagues uh, from the Zika affected uh, uh, areas uh, that we just met via uh, Zika plan. And I think their input was uh, essential to make uh, this, uh, this guideline uh, uh, feasible. And then we had uh, contact with uh, uh, Ready and the Global Health uh, Network to develop a GBS uh, knowledge hub in which we would like to explain on a website exactly uh, these steps. Uh, that was also important for uh, colleagues who were unable to uh, have access to, uh, to the literature. So um, what is important um, is that um, uh, this was not the first uh, pandemic or outbreak that was related to uh, the Guillain-Barre yeah. syndrome. Uh, One second. Okay. Um, uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm at home with my, with my daughter who is in quarantine at the, at the moment. Um, so in, in 1976, there was already a uh, flu vaccination, uh, which uh, was related to the Guillain-Barre syndrome. And that was followed in almost every year with uh, outbreaks of Campylobacter or chikungunya or Zika. And uh, now more recently, there's a lot of interest in SARS-CoV-2, whether that is uh, related to uh, the Guillain-Barre syndrome uh, as well. And 
in, in anticipation of, of, uh, of the, the issues that may arise um, when there are new infections, uh, especially uh, pandemics, uh, uh, where the Guillain Barre uh, syndrome is related to. Um, we wrote this uh, position paper where we uh, have indicated some limitations and, and opportunities for, uh, for further uh, investigations. Uh, this was definitely not an easy task um, to, uh, to investigate uh, the uh, relation between Zika and the Guillain Barre syndrome. One of the, uh, the major limitations we had was the, uh, the, the availability of the funding. So you can see this here in this graph. Um, in, in February uh, in 2015, uh, WHO declared Zika virus a public health uh, emergency. Then the uh, European Union responded very fast with uh, uh, having this funding uh, uh, ready, uh, but still it took about uh, nine months before we received that funding and could really start with our ICO Sika project and hire people and support uh, people uh, in the affected countries. And that by that time, most of the Sika uh, epidemic was already uh, gone. So it was much more difficult to get access to, uh, to patient materials and data. Luckily enough, before the time, we were already uh, able to share our protocol with others who could make a sooner start, but this is, really an important aspect to consider for, uh, for the future. So this is no criticism to the EU because I think they responded uh, very fast, but it just illustrates the bureaucracy and all the steps that need to be taken before a research can really start. And that's, I think, a very crucial factor when there is an, uh, an pandemic ongoing. So what are the, um, in our view, uh, the challenges and the requirements for, for to get a good study infrastructure? is to have uh, what the lessons that we learned is that it's important to have a predefined study protocol for such a very specific disease as the Guillain-Barre syndrome uh, to, to get an, an access on what data is, is required for diagnostic accuracy, relevant clinical outcome measures, uh, how controls are defined. Um, then also uh, it is important to have the funding, uh, to have ethical permission and to uh, have the availability to share these uh, data and samples. But as, as I've shown you, the funding was, uh, well, it was a delay of, of, nine, uh, of nine months. And there are very strict uh, uh, regulations, as you know, uh, within Europe, the GDPR, uh, to uh, exchange uh, data and samples. Um, so how we approach this, um, um, I think it's very important that there is fast mobilization uh, of fundings uh, for the future. Um, so um, I'm very much looking forward to uh, initiatives uh, like uh, Clopid R, who may uh, help us in that. Um, and also there can be already a fast track review or upfront uh, approvals that are uh, ready in, in, in or already in place uh, just when a new outbreak will occur. And I think an important example of that, that it is possible is, uh, is, is, is done by the, by the NIH. Um, so um, I think another important aspect that made me realize is that if you want to investigate uh, GBS and probably that occurs in other diseases as well, is that clinical expertise is, uh, is key. There's, it's not possible in my view to have good uh, clinical research if there's no clinical expertise and for that the guideline was important. So I've explained to you that we have developed this guideline. Here you can see a representation of the countries uh, of the colleagues that were involved in that. Um, there are translations of that guideline in Spanish, Portuguese, and uh, Chinese. Chinese now upgoing, and all that information will be at the ready uh, uh, website of the uh, Global Health Network. And I'm pretty sure that that will be um, uh, uh, consulted very frequently. So um, you may have a look uh, at, the, at the website there uh, to see how that works. It's a very straightforward approach. You don't have to be a specialist. Uh, and in this 10 step approach, we hope to help all the clinicians that uh, may encounter a patient with the Guillain Barre syndrome. So the Knowledge Hub is currently uh, under development. Uh, we really want to extend that with courses and more updated information. Um, information about uh, research as well, where uh, people can also participate in. And also that's very important as a preparedness for, for clinical practice and for, for research. 
So the lack and see uh, regarding uh, the Guillain-Barre syndrome is the, is the network I think that we have uh, between IGOS and the many other uh, consortia that are uh, ongoing. So I think that's a very good global covering of, uh, of, uh, of uh, expertise in, in GBS. There is the international guideline that of course is a live uh, document that will be, uh, will be changed after there are new treatments or new uh, discoveries and the, the knowledge hub, which is uh, uh, under development. So there are many people that I would like to thank, um, especially uh, the people that I've met uh, in, uh, in Zika plan uh, from work package uh, two and four, but I also would like to thank uh, Trudy Lang and her team for support uh, via the global health network in the, in the GBS knowledge hub and uh, providing the opportunity to share the, the guideline with, uh, with many others. And my last but not least uh, slide is to, to thank again the European uh, Union uh, who supported uh, our work. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Dr. Jacob. Um, I, we have, uh, we now have a, a few minutes for uh, questions. Uh, we have a question from the chat for you. Um, is onset GBS primarily associated with only seeker? or other infectious diseases can trigger onset? For example, have you seen a rise in cases with COVID-19? Uh, you're on mute. Yeah. Okay, so, sorry. Yes, that, so, so there are many uh, infections that may trigger uh, the Guillain-Barre syndrome. Um, the most important ones are the Campylobacter jejuni, uh, cytomegalovirus, Epstein-Barr virus, mycoplasma pneumoniae, um, and hepatitis E virus. Um, then we have a new one that's, that's Zika. Um, and um, uh, it's still not sure uh, if there is an association between uh, SARS-CoV-2 infections and the Guillain-Barre syndrome. So there have been cases reported or case series, but true association studies are lacking. Um, there has been a national study in the UK uh, showing no increase in Guillain-Barre cases during the Zika uh, outbreak, but that still does not exclude that in rare cases uh, this may occur. And within ICOS, we are now investigating a case series, uh, and we have found uh, several patients with um, uh, the Guillain Bray syndrome and preceding uh, SARS CoV 2 infection without any other uh, infections. And they seem to have a kind of a viral uh, phenotype regarding their clinical features and electrophysiology. But still, I would like to underscore that that is not not a proof that SARS-CoV-2 in fact can cause uh, the Guillain-Barre syndrome, and certain research is needed for that. Thank you. And and actually, I have a, a question for you. I mean, you've presented a wonderful way that all um, this work has come together, and then you know, accumulating in the first international consensus guidelines, etc. I think the willingness to share data and sharing protocols has really transformed the, the uh, and accelerated the pace of research uh, to inform uh, clinical care uh, and policy, et cetera. But um, can, you, can you comment on how sustainable this is beyond, you know, between waves of um, uh, these infections or, or it, it's, it's the syndrome itself um, um, you know, you could, could it be sustained um, and, and during peacetime as well as uh, during uh, epidemics? Yeah, so so we, we are very willing to share uh, our protocol as we did uh, in the past. Um, uh, so th that protocol will always be uh, available, but I think the protocol can be improved. Uh, and um, we are about to have uh, the last patient included in IGOS. So uh, when our aim was to, re to reach 2000 inclusions, but we are, uh, we will develop a new uh, IGOS 2.0 uh, uh, format, which will be more effective uh, and focused on, on certain areas. And uh, also that protocol will be made available for, uh, for the whole world. Um, even if you're not interested to really uh, participate in ICOS itself, uh, you can still use uh, the protocol. And, and what is my experience in Zika plan is that 
when other groups are then using the same protocol, then it still is possible to compare data or share data afterwards. And they have a kind of, of independence uh, for, for controlling their data collection. Um, and, and the ICOS consortium can live with that. So we are definitely uh, regarding ICOS, uh, let's say protocols, we are, we are willing to share that in the future as well. But there will be new developments. There will be new infections. Uh, the diagnostic criteria are about to change. Uh, there's a lot of development in, in the treatment of the Guillain-Barre syndrome. Uh, so this is, this is all uh, a, a dynamic situation uh, that needs updates. And um, I think a very crucial thing is the, uh, the, the connection uh, between neurologists uh, from, from all over uh, the world uh, to give input. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's my most precious thing that, that we, we have now that, that collaboration ongoing. And I would like to invest a lot uh, in that uh, in the next years as well. And, and would funding be um, easier to get because of, you know, everybody banding together, you think? Yes, I, I hope so. In, also what may help. in competition, right? Between yeah, no, absolutely. And, and this is a rare disease. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so we are competing with more, much more frequent neurological diseases. But I think everyone has seen now that uh, in Zika that there may be an association between the pandemic and, and the Guillain-Barre syndrome. And... Uh, I'm very uh, happy that uh, there was no very strong association between SARS-CoV-2 and GBS. Otherwise, there would be a really dramatic situation. Uh, and this may be a good momentum for uh, to get an, an, an more, uh, a more bigger support for international uh, uh, co coordination of, uh, of research. Uh, and I hope that the political uh, ambition is there uh, as well to, uh, to to do this, but we will just have to see how things are going. Okay. Well, thank you. And, and I do have a question in the chat, uh, in the Q&A on uh, the, um, whether we have um, uh, good diagnostics now to diagnose uh, um, acute infection, especially for screening pregnant women. So I think that um, the situation is similar to those, uh, uh, what we do in dengue, which is for surveillance, uh, uh, a lot of countries use IgM uh, because the um, uh, IgM antibodies persist for about five to six months. So you could, if somebody's IgM positive, you could only say that they had a recent, um, uh, but uh, not necessarily uh, an infection associated with the episode of fever patient has at the moment. And so uh, for surveillance purposes, we, um, in uh, pregnant women or in other individuals, uh, we use IgM and uh, usually in a population there's a, a endemic or low level um, IgM. But uh, when you have an outbreak, then you would see all of a sudden more people who are IgM positive, as well as the teeters are higher. And so, uh, so that's how it's used. Now for um, the uh, diagnosis, uh, clinical diagnosis uh, of um, uh, say pregnant women, uh, in a clinical setting, if the women presents uh, for, for care with an episode of fever, um, and uh, the onset is within the first seven days, of course, the idea would be to use molecular testing, but many physicians will use IgM. And uh, we now have uh, through the uh, UNICEF uh, USAID um, effort, uh, we now have quite specific tests for Zika, which can be used. And we also have multiplex tests that uh, includes all other uh, major arboviruses, um, and, or you, you could have a specific uh, uh, Zika IgM and IgG test. And so if you, you like more information, we, uh, we could send those to you. Um, any other questions? If not, we're um, right on time. And I want to turn this uh, session uh, back to Annalise and thank uh, uh, Dr. Jacobs for his great presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you, Rosanna, for sharing and speaking. And thank you, Bart. For, for speaking so excellently. So we're now coming to our concluding remarks. Uh, let me again thank the Global Health Network for putting this webinar together, especially Bonnie Baker. Uh, again, please do have a look at our website 
Um, there you can also find the scientific publications. Today we focus a lot on the legacy, the networks, but of course there's, an, there's a huge scientific output as well. Allow me to also thank Margot Luciani and her team from the Fondation Merieu for creating and maintaining uh, an exciting Ziga Plan website, keeping up to date with the publications, putting together four videos. Um, Margot, if you can speak, are the four videos already up on the website or probably still coming on the website, Margot? Yes, they are on the website now. The first one that was shown today is on the website and the link has been shared in the chat. And we will also share the link through the Twitter account. Thank you so much, Margot, for leading all the Twitter, the, the websites, etc., and to the Global Health Network for hosting uh, the website. We would also like to thank Corin Woolman Tardy, who, saved, who served as our Ziga Plan Communication Director for, from the very beginning of Ziga Plan and really helped us strategize the, uh, the communication plan. And also the logo that you see in the, our background that is, that is really from, the, from her team. Um, then I would now like to hand over to a very, very special person. And this is Raman Preet, who over the past years served as the most efficient and kind executive director of Ziga Plan. Over to you, Raman. Uh, thank you so much, Annelise. Uh, I think it has been amazing uh, last five years working with all of us. But can I please request you to stop sharing your screen? Thank you. Because I have some, uh, you know, I want to lighten up our moment. We are not so many left. And I'm sure some of us who've stayed back are going to enjoy because, you know, there has been a constant thanks for certain people. But I felt we would, I would like to remember some others or just bring us all together. So I'm going to quickly share screen. And I would like you all to stay with me for next five minutes. <clears throat> and also see that we are starting from 2016 till 2021. And because we've moved on into the social media world where it's hashtags have become more important than we started. So we are a consortium, we are a project, we are a collaboration. We are an international co uh, cooperation and our hashtag is Zika Plan Unite. You heard Annelise so nicely putting us that together we stand stronger and I think united we achieve more. Many of you have heard, I just want to say 2016, this is how we started. By June 2016, we were awarded. You've heard a lot about some delays, but was very uh, vividly talking about them. But still, this is how, so exactly five years ago, we became a consortium. This is how we got formed. These crosses say these uh, members left us, <clears throat> but the others joined. It was a movement of one coordinator, so we had to make a change. But otherwise, we haven't had any hiccups. Also, we got the privilege of working with other uh, projects, which you've heard today, Zika Action and Zika Alliance. And I think it has been a pleasure and we cannot express more the way we've done in our panel discussion. Further, this is how we planned our objectives. The red means we weren't very sure. So we really want to kind of, you know, work on things which were alarming. And we felt the blue is when we've achieved certain things, we'll be able to talk a bit more creatively and come. And I think today you've heard more about our blue uh, wheel rather than the red, but of course the red has brung, uh, brought us to our blue wheel. You heard so much about our work packages in the past three web webinars, but we never showed you the intricate picture that stands behind these webinars and how these work packages has worked around. This is how we are, 15 work packages in Zika plan. These are our shared ones with Zika Action Alliance. And each work package, of course, has a lovely title, but each work package has a person behind who is supposed to deliver. And here you see the names. So I'm adding certain names here because we call work package leaders, but there are some people who have been key in making sure we are able to report, we are submitting our deliverables, and we are able to get our funds that make this project moving. So thanks to all these leaders behind these work packages. And our timeline has been very interesting. 
you know, we started with 2016, meeting at his CFA Brazil, where it all started. Mark, thank you, Pernambuco and University for hosting us then. In 2017, we had the pleasure of being at Havana, dancing, enjoying, and we did our fun in Cuba. In 2018, we were in London. Something happened. So this is a project coordinator story. Something happened. So there is something missing here, which you will not see later. But then in 2019, we were in Cali, Colombia, where we were at our peak, I would say, where we had media coverage, uh, Dr. Lida Soria, you know, Carlos, you've heard about them. It was well done. But then came something more that hit us in a different way. And we had to rethink how we are going to work towards our communication and dissemination. We got further extension, we got no more money, but we got more time. And we started to become more in deliberation of how we are going to disseminate ourselves. We've done three webinars, this is our final end. So I wanted to share maybe this, so you all know who are with us, that this has been a challenging work, but we've done it well. Our four operational areas were research, training and capacity building, networking and dissemination. This were always ongoing. Of course, things were a little different in the beginning, but the past five years, we've come along and making sure that there is not just North-South, but there has been South-South collaborations as well. We have 100 Zika plan publications out, 98 are available on our website, two will be added. And there are many more in preparation, so please keep an eye on that. Currently, the European Commission is actually asking for a lot on how would you create your impact? How would you improve your impact? And I think I would like to share with all my work package leaders and other members and all the audience who's sitting here, we followed this results-based manage management approach where we have looked at inputs, activities, outcomes, outputs, and impacts. And the entire story that you've heard today wasn't without this. So this is how, this is too detailed to be explained, but I just thought you can see how much work has gone behind. So here comes our wonderful time together. Hisife working in the hospital, media coverage. It was, as you've heard since the earlier in the afternoon, how people and us have worked together in collaboration. Here I also want to talk about the possibilities and power of projects, programs, partnerships, but people. It's the people who make things happen. It's our complementary approach. We synthesize, we synergize. And if we have a mandate, I think we perform better. This is again Cuba, Colombia. It's been an amazing journey. London is missing for some reason. But we became this. Right now, that's where we are. We all are in Zoom and we are trying to smile and make sure we are not, we still are there for each other. So I, this is our last webinar where we were saying goodbyes to all of us. And this list is definitely not exhaustive. Thanks to each one of you mentioned here. I'm sure I've forgotten some people and I'm sure I can't do justice in acknowledging each and every one, but I can say once an email would go, it would go to at least 125 people many times. And there has been nothing but positive response. I do want to uh, thank these two people who Annalise has been doing. I thought I'll show their face before they put their camera on. And I, um, Bonnie Baker and Margot. And I especially want to acknowledge in the coordination story, finance managers and administrative contacts of every single partner who have been in this venture for making our reports happen and our European Commission project officers who have changed in the past four years, I think every year. So it's like starting a journey every new time. And finally, my big thanks to my scientific leader, Professor Annelies Wildersmith. We worked for 10 years now with two different projects. It has been an amazing, beautiful journey together. And I think this particular day has been very special because that's one time we've spent together in these 10 years looking at things we really enjoyed. So thank you, Annalise, and for the Department of Epidemiology and Global Health for hosting us. And finally, of course, we all cannot thank enough to uh, European Union for funding and our Zika Action and Zika Alliance partners. So thanks to all of you for sticking by and be with us and being here today. It has been nothing but very special.